Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Operations Committee meeting of Tuesday, May 16th. Uh, but first up, we land acknowledgement. As we gather to here, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as we gather today, I would respectfully acknowledge on behalf of Council and the com community, the City of Pembroke resides in unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We thank the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. It is with this statement that we honor and respect the Algonquins whose land we reside. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Approval of the meeting agenda. Moved by Councillor Lefrené, second by Councillor Purcell. Those in favor? Approved. The approval of the minutes of Operations Committee meeting of April 18th. Moved by Councillor Keel, second by Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Those in favor? No, uh, point of information, I was absent from that meeting. I was in Toronto on, on city business. Okay, well then I guess you can approve that. Councillor uh, Jackano will second it. Those in favor? Approved. First up is delegations, uh, staff recognition, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple things that I'll, uh, I'll say and then I'll turn it back over to you. Dramatic changes have happened in the last decade in the nature of municipal public works and operations. Management team roles and responsibilities are much more complex. The AOR's Public Works Leadership Development Program, also called PWLDP, was developed to help public works managers and supervisors develop and improve the skills they need to be top leaders for their municipalities. The eight modules of the program are prere prerequisites to the Certified Road Supervisors Accreditation, which is an invaluable tool for municipalities in dealing with the added expectations, increased standards, additional regulations, and growing responsibilities of public works and operations. Now I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So. <clears throat> We do have a uh, plaque for a presentation here this evening uh, to Ms. Mary Ellen McLaughlin. Uh, first, uh, a little bit of quick history. I've got a cheat sheet of notes here. I know this is, doesn't uh, near uh, list all her accomplishments and how much she does here for the city, but uh, quick notes to us. Mary Ellen's been here with the city for five years since this fall. She's a civil technician certified roads inspector as designated by OSET. Uh, she has certified an asset management planning Marielle has background in engineering field, and this certificate is for the completion of Public Works Leadership Development Program through AORS, which is an eight multi-day module completed over the, over the last two years. So I would ask Ms. Marielle, Ms. Mulog, come up, and we'll do a little presentation. Great. So, after seeing that, next up is the Moffat Street uh, resident update. Mr. Unruh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, so tonight we have Lee Costello and Alan Hyde. Uh, they're going to come and address the committee in regards to the struggles, the landslides along the Muskrat and Indian River have caused in regards to the uh, land, uh, landlord, land owners, sorry, in that area. Welcome to Council, and please proceed as you're, at your leisure. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. Um, so good evening. My name is Lee Costello. I am the owner of the property at 170 Welland Street. I'm here today with my father, Alan Hyde, as we want to ensure that the current council is aware and up to date regarding the situation happening within the city to dozens of homeowners along the Muskrat and Indian Rivers. When my slides come up, for those of you, <laughs> for those here around the table who have not um, come to visit the properties in person. I want to share some visuals with you today. I think that the council members have them in their packages. So on the first slide, <clears throat> 
On the left, you'll see photos of my property with a fence at my back at my back property line. As you can see, there are many mature trees and a lot of land beyond the fence. The Muskrat River is then located beyond those mature trees. On the right of this slide, you'll see photos taken in 2017 after the initial landslide that took place right around Easter weekend during historic flooding and historic river heights. In addition to the river continuing to eat away the shoreline, especially come springtime when river levels are highest, the landslide has also left a cliff bare of any vegetation increasing the amount and severity of the mudslides that now occur each year. This caused both the riverbank and cliff face to be vulnerable once again in 2019, where we saw record flooding. The photos on the second slide you'll see in the bottom right hand corner shows the exposed cliff that has caused substantial loss to my yard yet again this spring. If you look at the same photo, you'll see a large square brick. In 2021, we made the decision to tear down a portion of our back addition as we were afraid that the cliff was getting too close and that it was now unsafe. The brick you see in this photo is the foundation foot footing of our addition. So you can see just how close it is to the cliff. It's a mere two feet away. As you can see, the issue continues to get progressively worse each year, each year that passes, and spring flooding continues to be a regular occurrence. So what are we wanting from council, you may be asking. We need you all as our municipal representatives to advocate for us for provincial and federal funding to protect our safety, our properties, as well as the river environment. This is a complicated issue. We are not waterfront properties. We do not own the riverbanks, which are causing the issue. At this time, we are left with property that we do not own, continuing to disappear, which in turn is causing our own properties to continue to slide away more and more. To try and repair our own property as an individual at this time would be futile as we currently have no stable ground in order to rebuild upon. That is where the government needs to come in to stabilize its property so that we can be safe and attempt to rebuild. As homeowners, we feel completely trapped at this point. We cannot fix the issue on our own property until the public property is stabilized and we cannot sell. We are at the mercy of the government and therefore ask that we have the full support of the city representatives to help us in any way you can. The reality is that the public land is disappearing due to river activity and it is affecting the safety of privately owned lands in Pembroke, the city of Pembroke. We've heard a lot of things. It's also been mentioned we should be suing people. With all due respect, this solves nothing for homeowners or the city. That's not the route we're looking to go. This is a major issue that needs to be dealt with. Delaying or ignoring will have catastrophic results. Homes have already been lost in Pembroke to this issue. It is not going away and in fact will continue to get worse and more dangerous as time goes on. It is in our best interest as citizens and council to work together to solve this issue once and for all for the safety and well-being of so many ratepayers in our community. I'll now turn it over to my father to describe some of the risks and solutions. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm just wondering, is, are the slides coming up on this, this screen right here? Yeah. Do you have a copy? Out the slides in. So I wanted to help bring you up to date a little bit on the some of the I guess uh, technolo technological details with regards to the, the events and the relationship with the soil type that's in the area and that's actually the the uh, the issue at hand really. It's 
So it's, it's known as Leda clay, and it's, it's a, a soil type that, that occurs uh, very, f fairly far and wide throughout the Ottawa Valley and even on the Quebec side. And it was associated with the Champlain Sea when it uh, existed here uh, uh, immediately following the Ice Age. And so the Champlain Sea was here for about 800 years and in, as it uh, existed, it deposited this very, very fine silty clay. Uh, and so there's, there's layers and layers of this, this clay in the vicinity and, and some of it uh, approaches 100 meters in depth further to the east. Uh, but here it's, it's deep enough, it's uh, probably 15 to 20 meters in places. So uh, Lita clay is different than many other kinds of clay in that as it becomes saturated with water, it liquefies. And so it will actually flow like uh, thick liquid. And if, uh, if it, it has weight on top of it, in addition to being liquefied, uh, it, uh, it will in fact move, it'll squash, and it'll run like a river. In the instance in 2017, uh, that was, there was, uh, what led up to that was probably a couple of weeks of, of day after day rain uh, on top of the, uh, the snows that had been in place. And so it did supersaturate that clay that, that occurs in, in the Moffat Street and, and Welland Street area. And um, then during the night, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that slope that was behind several residences on along Moffat Street and uh, Welland Street on that corner where the, where the river uh, strikes to, to move before it moves uh, in an easterly direction again. Uh, because the flow of water in the river was also very high at the time, so there was I increased velocity, increased energy in the water, uh, I submit that it, it uh, took out the banks of, of the river at the time. Now, those banks had been stable for a very long time, and all of you know that, and so was the slope stable for a very long time, and there's really no expectation that it, uh, when Lee bought the property, or others bought their properties, that it was, was about to slide into the river. However, uh, I believe that our weather patterns and our climate, cha climate changes, changing circumstances, and led up to the issue that's at hand with regards to the Lita clay. Now, Lita clay has been studied for a long, long time. The Ministry of Natural Resources studied it back in the 1970s and, and uh, uh, sent techni technicians and engineers out to take a good look at, uh, at where it existed, uh, specifically in the Pembroke just area here uh, as, uh, from this office, and, uh, and came to some conclusions around the issues that might be at hand in the future. And uh, since 2017 and through 2019, the city, as you know, has, has uh, contracted uh, the en local engineering group to take a, a much closer look and come up with, with uh, a report and some recommendations with regards to what needs to be done uh, around that uh, area of the Muskrat River and the Indian River, which basically involves more than 80 homes uh, not all of which are at, at, in immediate danger, but all of which uh, can and, and could be impacted somewhere in the future if, uh, if no action is taken. Uh, so the ministry spent some time understanding that. Unfortunately, the province of Ontario took no steps uh, to, to mitigate anything uh, with regards to, to the concerns that were identified. And, uh, However, Ministry of Natural Resources does have an emergency response responsibilities associated with, with land sites, and so they, and they're also the, the agency that's responsible for uh, uh, subsoils, not, uh, not topsoils, but subsoils and aggregates. Um, and that was confirmed in a, in a 2022 report that the Auditor General, Ontario's Auditor General did. So what happens to lead a clay when it's saturated is, is that it loses its solidity and it, 
and it flows like thick uh, fluid, like I said. So in 2017, the first occurrence of the landslide uh, was, uh, took out um, probably, I'm going to say, if not, ten, uh, not hundreds, certainly tens, many tens of tons of clay that uh, was, was seen uh, drop in, uh, slide down and into, that, uh, into the river at, at that uh, corner, uh, just at Pansy Patch Park. And, and if you want to see, could see confirmation of that, you can, when the, when the water goes down the Ottawa River behind us here at the outflow of the, of the muskrat, you can see the clay deltas that have been produced uh, at, at the mouth of the river there, and they're extensive. They, they cover uh, acres of, of uh, area. So the, when, the, when the material slid, and it took all, took all the vegetation, it took the mature trees, and the trees didn't topple over, they slid down with the material and wound up standing again in the river in, in some instances. Uh, that's how it occurred, as a slide. Um, and it, so it occurred again in, in 2019 in a similar way, uh, both uh, on the same properties and, and one or two adjacent properties as well. So what needs to be done? Well, it, in, in what I've been, been uh, purporting since the beginning, and, and the mayor and John, uh, the previous mayor, and John uh, Jakubowski has, has supported the idea of as well and has been working towards it, was that, first of all, the hardening of the, the river banks uh, in the locations where, at least in the locations where the, the risk is the greatest first and get, get the, the, that uh, uh, undercutting uh, stopped and mitigated so that uh, no more of the, uh, the steep um, hillsides can, will uh, be uh, caused to slide down if there is another occasion, another spring or any time at all where, there's, where the clay gets saturated in a similar manner as it has twice already. Um, so that's what I think, I believe it needs to be the first step. Now the engineers also started, uh, identified additional steps including uh, the installation of drainage uh, pipes that be driven into the walls of the, of the hills and that's, I understand that that's uh, probably a, a difficult and, a, and an expensive endeavor but it certainly would add to the, the uh, to addressing the problem. Uh, if that, uh, if rather than seeing the clay get saturated, it actually could be drained at the same time. Um, the the engineers also identified the need to place uh, some sort of barrier on the the now cliff faces and uh, that exist where uh, where that or it's only bare clay uh, when there's nothing else holding the clay there except its own resilience, uh, which, you know, as I said, it disappears when it's saturated. And so, you know, shot rock, uh, uh, something, any sort of rock support that would lay heavy on the sides of the, of the lead of clay and prevent it from, from pushing it out, or at least mitigate from it pushing out and sliding down, uh, would be helpful. And I know that you're, you uh, are planning to do something like that, at the, at the Moffat Street corner already on the city's property, and so I don't have to explain, <laughs> explain it to you, you know what's happening there. Um, so I understand that the city has, has great limits in terms of being able to address this on its own, and, it, and, it ha and we've, we've understood that from the beginning. We, we've, we haven't had any doubts about that. Uh, we also understand that it, with the uh, mitigation, sorry, the, the disaster mitigation funding that has been applied for, uh, there's, there's challenges associated with that too because it's I think a 60/40 cut, which means there's still you know millions of dollars on on the uh, required that the the federal government doesn't cover. Uh, I think that uh, the province hasn't yet stepped up. And I, uh, at least to the degree that they could, and and I look to other occasions where other provinces have stepped up and assisted with this. In the case of Saguenay, Quebec, for example, 
uh, the, it was about it was a spring ago where it had almost an identical slide, uh, same height, same breadth, two houses lost, and in that instance, the, their premier was on site in three days with with assistance in hand, and so uh, I think our premier also uh, could step up in a similar way. To that extent, I think that he, although I know John has has uh, addressed it with him, and I believe the Minister of Municipal Affairs has addressed it with him. Uh, I'm not sure that he, he's gotten the picture. So I, I really, I, I think that uh, there, may st there is still a role for this, uh, this council to address the Premier directly. And I know that's not something that's done, done often, it's not a, not a custom, but it can be done. And the reason I say it can be done, because I've, I've listened to uh, and researched the sorts of, of uh, occasions when this premier has come with check in hand to other municipalities and has stated in, on the record that, in, at least in one instance, that he, he had a $16 million check because that mayor kept calling him week after week after week. He said it. So there may be some value in that kind of uh, approach, at least to create understanding on his behalf. Um, I, I don't know, and Dave, I'm sure does know, that the, there may be other infrastructure funding availabilities that uh, could possibly cover such a thing. The, the first application through the disaster relief program, um, I, I know, was seeking uh, 23 million, I think, something like that. It was over 20 million because, unfortunately, that program requires at least a 20 million dollar application, and that's just beyond reason for a small municipality. Um, and it's out of reach. So, if there are other sorts of funding sources, I would suggest that if they could be looked at, that the project be broken into steps, and that and deal with the the uh, areas that the engineers have identified as being the most at risk, the highest risk, and then, and then if that was funded and dealt with, I think it might also proceed with the extent for follow-up applications for stage two. And that works out very well. I'll give you a fact that that would make that sort of activity. So it's, it, it's important, I think, that, that we understand, and you do understand, that this is not just a local problem. It, it extends to, the, to our employer and we, from the other side of uh, Ottawa and many other municipalities. And I, I'm just wondering if there isn't an opportunity for a collective of municipalities to be able to put their heads together and approach the province of Ottawa and say, lead of clay that it can blow away uh, if it has the energy to do so. So it's going to keep happening, folks, and it needs, in, in my opinion, needs to be addressed. 
I'll just just would like to, if you would, would let me, I'll just finalize by saying, by showing my gratitude, recognizing the support that that um, Mayor LeMay has uh, gave, given to this over the past more than five years. And also uh, John Yakubuski has been tremendously supportive by way of, of uh, going to his, uh, his, his level of government and speaking to it. And so. the work the city's doing. Oh, the city staff have done wonderful things. Yeah, they've really, they've been great. They've, been, they've listened to us. They've done what they can do with regards to applications and so on. So I, I thank them as well. I really do. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry your... if I went over time. <laughs> it's okay. It's an important issue. I know it takes time to discuss it. I'll open up to council. Then I have Councillor Jackano first for comments. Thank you for coming under such duress. <clears throat> and such stress living in an area of that uh, particular uh, environment must be an awful thing to wake up to every day. Uh, I have to comment on uh, one thing. In 1971, in the Lac Saint-Jean Saguenay area at uh, Saint-Jean Vianney, 40 homes slipped into a void. 30 people died. 30 people died. No warning, okay? The Moffat Street people have been given a warning by Mother Nature. It's saying something is going to happen here. I think we've, we've endeavored to do our best, Your Worship. I know you've probably uh, been lobbying uh, along with uh, you know, our, our chairman as well. Uh, 1,700 people had to be re replaced in that area and they were moved to Arvida, Quebec. And the reason I know all this minute stuff is because I worked there. I saw the hole. I saw what those people went through. I worked in the, uh, the Saguenay Valley area for a number of summers as a young person. Uh, I think we should be looking at what the resolution was with the Quebec government, what happened to those residents. Maybe we could do a little research. Although it's 50 years ago, there has to be a record somewhere that says that the government either stepped up I don't know what happened afterwards. I don't think they allowed them to go back to that area. So there were 1,700 people displaced out of, that's a small village, can't live here because there's, there's a soil problem. <clears throat> and as you said, uh, Lita clay becomes like quicksand when it's wet, it's super saturated, and it, it, it's like pebbles, it rolls. And when it starts to roll, everything rolls behind it. You worship, I, I think, perhaps, uh, you know, at, at your wish, that you should perhaps meet with the Premier of the province uh, to, to indicate you know, the, the sensitivity and the urgency of what's happening here. I mean, people can come and go back home and say, well, we did take a look at it, it looks pretty bad. We may give them some money, but we're waiting to hear. Worship, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, coming uh, this evening to uh, approach council. We have uh, a mix uh, uh, in terms of uh, council, and I know that you had an excellent relationship uh, with uh, former Mayor LeMay. Um, I'm hoping to impress upon you that not only was the prior councils um, very uh, interested and concerned uh, about the situation, but so is this uh, so is this uh, particular uh, uh, council concerned as well? I know that I've, I've uh, at the invitation, gone to see Ms. Costello's uh, property to see firsthand what it is that uh, uh, was taking place because photos, photos are better than nothing if you've never been there, but uh, actually seeing things in person sometimes gives it a fresh perspective. Um, so that you're aware and all members of council are, are aware now that we've migrated past uh, certain items that council needed to deal with early on, uh, I've picked up that, that mantle, if you will, so to speak, in terms of uh, former Mayor LeMay. I have written to uh, Minister Clark as well as our MPP to uh, continue on that discussion to lobby as what is being suggested by uh, Councillor Jackano. We have a report that's coming uh, forward later on to, uh, this evening uh, where there's been delegations. I know the, uh, the Deputy Mayor has made delegations. Uh, I've been part of delegations with Mr. Lewis. Uh, so we continue to uh, try and get the ear of the province 
response because I appreciate that you're recognizing that uh, so the federal government may come to the table and have a certain pot of money, uh, but the city and the federal government isn't enough. We need the province at the table as well. Uh, we, need, we need support from them. Um, I don't know, and I'm just going to be brutally honest with you, I don't know whether uh, the province recognizes that perhaps, as it's being discussed, that there's issues throughout the province and maybe they're scared and maybe they're scared with climate change and so forth that uh, um, it's like uh, Pembroke isn't the only spot that there's other municipalities but we have to be at the table I appreciate that uh, we have to be at the table to get uh, our fair share as they say and in terms of funding I have no doubt and I have every faith in, in uh, staff that all the work that's been done thus far and all the commitment thus far in terms of they have the know-how how to fix it it's we need the money <laughs> and with that support with that money then we we could uh, be able to uh, try and rectify uh, the the situation, and I and I do appreciate that you're also recognizing that rivers try to straighten themselves because every time I look at the picture and see Moffat's point, it's, it's it crosses my mind that the river's trying to effectively cut off the point as as far as as far as I can tell, just looking at the uh, photo. So I do appreciate that you're here, and I hope that we're able to impress upon you that we are taking it seriously. We will continue on. Uh, this was only a, a few weeks ago that now I've been able to uh, pick up that uh, item. Um, and uh, we do have an excellent relationship with their uh, local MPP uh, to continue to have discussions. And this has been one of the items that reoccurring uh, is put on his plate to say, we need a, a, a solution to this. We need the province to come to the table so that we can assist our ratepayers because our ratepayers throughout, we're a population of what, 14,000 maybe? I do appreciate one of your suggestions is, and it's uh, something that, uh, um, is in its infancy stage is working with other municipalities in terms of that common goal because it was brought to my attention recently at another function and I had an opportunity to speak to uh, the mayor of one of our neighboring municipalities and they said you realize that river flows through our municipality too and it's doing the same thing in our municipality um, and so after a while sometimes you, you begin to just look at your municipality but it's a bigger it's a bigger issue and it may be that that will have a bigger impact having the support of another mayor that's uh, saying it's happening in my municipality as well let's have funding that's available for both of our municipalities um, so I do appreciate you coming this evening and uh, make no mistake we're we are aware and we are trying to uh, find a solution for you any other comments question deputy mayor uh, thank you so Lee and now when I was there a few weeks ago we talked and I you know I I feel for you looking at the further deterioration of the land it, it's uh, it's terrible and so we talked about uh, I, when I was in Toronto a few weeks ago I had mentioned to John Yankabuski that a letter would be coming from the mayor and mr. Lewis which has been sent asking for some action I know Al that you commented uh, when Minister Clark was here a few years ago, he made a comment about being more more compassionate than the former government, and you have contacted his department. Is that correct? And what reply do you get? I, I, I'm sorry. I have uh, not recently, but uh, uh, I have, on a couple of occasions at least, uh, been in touch with uh, uh, one of his aides, at, who who has always been helpful to me, but. Uh, he uh, couldn't offer anything, obviously, he's, he's right. the aide, he's not the minister. Uh, so, but absolutely, the minister did say that. He, showed, he was actually demonstrating compassion to the mm -hmm. issue and said that, uh, that their, uh, the new provincial government of the day was going to be a more compassionate and more concerned government. Uh, and that was what he left me with. And so. Okay. So we'll definitely have to keep lobbying for that. And as Councillor Jackano says, if that doesn't work, we'll have to uh, just speak directly to the Premier's office. And, and you know, it's not just the local problem. I mean, Laurentian Valley's having issues too, mm -hmm. and it has to be dealt with. And it takes all levels of government. And Pembroke, you know, you know, we can't afford to fix it on our own. We need the feds and the province to step up. And so we are advocating for you, and we're there with you. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Lafrenia. Um, I just want to thank you for your understanding. I mean, in a situation such as you're in, most people would come in here with fists flying and, you know, demanding. And I'm, 
I don't know how you're having the patience with us, but I'm glad that you understand that like this is a, in 2019, this was almost a $31 million project. So we don't know what the cost is now. And based on the 2019, our cost would be 28 million if the province doesn't kick in. So I really wanna thank you. It, it must be difficult to come in here and not just be upset. So I rest assured, I, I trust that the mayor now like will take that uh, lead. And I know that staff has a report, like he said, to talk about it. And we, we com you know, completely agree. I think we need to go on knock, knock on the premier's door because I've seen him do the same thing as what you're saying. So again, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Councillor Kiel. Well, I'm glad that this council has finally realized that it should be knocking on the Premier's door. Uh, frankly, that's what I said. Um, Councillor Franny, I see you rolling your eyes, and yeah. i got to tell you, yeah. you've been called out on that before. Yeah, I have. In, uh, during the debate, I raised the issue that we should be doing more, that filing a piece of paper was just not enough and sitting back and waiting. Um, I'm fully aware, just like everybody else is around this table, that we don't have 28 or 30 or 40 or whatever millions of dollars it would be right now. But I got to, I got to tell you, our efforts thus far have been extraordinarily quiet since I've been on this council since November. Um, it was back in, it was back in November that I met it, met you at uh, at your house, and I. Uh, I asked, uh, I asked one of our departments for a report on exactly where, where are we with, with what is going on here. And I've never received an actual response to that question. Um, I know we talked, in, we talked in December about protecting a city asset, being the road and, and the outfall, um, but we certainly, haven't, we certainly haven't talked about what we, what we can and what we should and what we could be doing about residents whose livelihoods and houses are at risk. Um, let's, be, let's be clear about what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about where are we going to get the money from, and what we seem to have going on at the moment is we seem to have a reality that we don't have all the money. We have a provincial government pointing to a federal program to ask for money, and we have a federal program that from a constitutional perspective, the federal government's not responsible for local matters. This is actually completely within the sphere of the provincial jurisdiction. The fact that the federal government has a pot of money for disaster relief and whatnot, quite frankly, is just like the federal government contributing to healthcare. It's not their project, but they do contribute some money. But at the end of the day, the buck needs to stop with the province on this being a local matter. And it was during the fall uh, election at the, at the debate where I said, we should be knocking on the Premier's door every day. And I don't know that we have over the last several months. Um, so when Councillor Lafreniere talks about your patience, I'm, I'm equally applauding you for your patience. Um, because I don't know how I don't know how you haven't driven down to Toronto yet to yell at the the premier, um, if for no other reason than there's a bit of a line uh, to do that. Um, I think what we should be doing is making it less of an ask and more of a demand. And I say that based on the fact that that this has been several years in the making. We have made asks, we have talked with them, we have been polite. Um, I saw on TV actually the 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 one that you discussed with the premier saying, uh, and I can't remember if it was the the mayor or whatnot, but he you know he said that you know they keep calling me and you know hope, hopefully they'll stop now and I think I think he kind of chuckled about it. Um, so if if that's where we're at, then perhaps it should be less of an ask and it should be more of a demand, and we should be raising this at every opportunity with every minister that we can get a hold of. Um, I don't know if the, if the mayor raised it uh, with the premier when he was up here earlier this year, um, but it, at every conference, at every, at every running into of every minister, that's how things get done in government. There's, there's issues that's on the government's agenda, that's their issues, and then there's everybody else's issues. Their issues are easy. They, they push through their own issues, but 
when you talk about, you know, you talk about the Quebec Premier in either 2017 or 2019, he, the Quebec Premier was promising money from the flood zone while the flood was still going on. We haven't seen that. Um, so I, th I think at this point the, and I know some people are going to criticize me and say, oh, he, there he goes grandstanding again. I'm not grandstanding. I'm saying I think that's what's needed is some publicity on this, some negative publicity towards the government, and to say to them, we did the back, we did the back, uh, the back room work, we filed our applications, you still haven't come out with your wallet. And that's, we know that's what's needed. So I'm, I'm glad that I might just be a bit more blunt than some of my colleagues around this table, but I'm glad that we are at the point where now we're saying, we're identifying that this is probably in the Premier's hands and that it's, it's time to tell him what our thoughts are. We've made the application, we've given him lots of time, now it's time to make a demand. And I do think that's the point where we're at. I don't know where else we could be at at this point. Um, because sitting and waiting, I certainly don't think, uh, I don't think it's, it's fair to residents. I know the erosion hasn't, hasn't stopped, and I know, Ms. Costello, you're not the only one uh, where the erosion hasn't stopped. We can't keep sitting back and doing the same thing. We, we need to do something, and so I would be, um, I'd be fully behind Councillor Jackano and Councillor Lafreniere saying, yeah, I think it is time to raise this up a little bit, um, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be hearing that around this table. Okay, I, I have uh, Councillor Purcell, as he hasn't said any words yet, uh, then I'll have Councillor Lafreniere. Uh, thanks, Lionel, uh, for, for your presentation today. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to meet with residents at all the high impact areas that are identified as red. And in fact, my wife grew up uh, on Moffat Street uh, in one of those red areas. And I can tell you the size of the backyard um, from, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, well, maybe a little longer than that, maybe 30 years ago, uh, compared to what it is now, it's, it's, it's a postage stamp now. Um, and I remember playing, you know, sports in the back uh, in terms of that area. So I hear you. I hear your frustrations. Um, definitely, um, you have my support. Um, I will do everything in my power to uh, to lobby uh, in for um, some remediation um, in terms of our application and getting our application approved and those dollars that are needed. Um, and then we've got to start looking at you know how we can look at um, that study. I think uh, you brought up a great point, Al, in terms of the Leader Clay study uh, with other municipalities and seeing how if there's things that we can do, such as vegetation. Um, to allow um, the stability of those things. Maybe there's some minor things that we can do in terms of different areas within the river that we can uh, look at maybe just, you know, you know, providing some stability to those banks. Um, and, and, and again, vegetation. So there must be something there that we can probably look at. Um, you know, I would welcome, you know, feedback from National Res or the Ministry of Natural Resources to see if there's um, some sort of opportunity where they could come in and, and, and look at the, the soil and also identify maybe what's appropriate in terms of vegetation that would, um, you know, help with the saturation of that soil. Um, so I feel for you guys, um, definitely, you know, uh, the fear of losing your home, um, you know, uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's an unim unimaginable. And I'm sure that, you know, also goes along with that, it goes insurance costs and um, the, the damages to your property, uh, like sell your fence disappear, uh, a, a back um, a, um, addition to your, uh, to your property had to be removed as a result. So uh, I think we, um, I think, you know, Councillor Keel and uh, Councillor um, Lafreniere are on the right track and I think what we really need to do is really lobby um, the, the provincial government for, uh, and, and really kind of hold them accountable to say, hey, this is a big, big issue for these, uh, these homeowners and uh, this is going to be, it's only going to get worse. Um, you know, I've lost land in the, uh, you know, in the Ottawa River in regards to, to flooding. Um, so there's opportunities we need to look at, you know, how are we going to uh, mitigate some of these types of issues or um, how do we relocate? And uh, those are some of those uh, real um, considerations that we need to look at and, and how do we look at something that's fair in terms of um, the value of the property. So um, again, thank you for coming tonight and uh, I feel for your situation. Thank you. Councilor Frenny. Just a quick comment. I'm glad to see um, that we are all on the same page. 
And the reason I rolled my eyes at Councillor Keel is because in election time, when we were asked that question on candidates' night, the existing councillors knew we didn't have the capacity as a municipality to pay to have it completely, you know, um, mit mitigated as it's shown in that engineer's study with the rock and everything. And I know that Councillor Keel didn't understand. He knew how serious an issue it was, but he was saying, let's just fix it. Well, now I'm, I'm really happy to, yes, I'm pretty happy to see that you understand, you know, if we had that kind of money sitting there, obviously. But I'm glad to see some cohesiveness and, and guaranteed. Yes, we didn't get off right away this, this term working on it, but there was a lot of things happening with this new council. So I think that we're starting to, to see some common goals, and I hope that this is the first big one that we can, we can take, take on. So thank you. Deputy Mayor, final comment? Just to comment and clarify what Councillor Keel was saying. Um, you and I went to see the property in November, and I mentioned to you that I had contacted the CEO, and a report from Mr. Lewis was coming forward, which is tonight's report. It's been delayed because of staff responsibilities and other projects, and I mentioned that to you. Um, I contacted the mayor uh, before I went to the Rural and Ontario Municipal Association meetings in January if he wanted me to do a delegation about this particular issue. And the mayor said no, it wasn't required because he went down to, I was at the AMO conference in August, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, as was the mayor, or he was deputy mayor then, and Mr. Lewis, and they gave a delegation regarding this issue to the province. So the mayor said, no, you don't need to. They are aware of the situation. We've already asked them for it. And then after the election, I had a phone call meeting with former Mayor LeMay, and he, you know, for quite a while, who was working extensively with you. And he gave me the rundown and the, the basics. And he said that the takeaways I got from our meeting was the fed, federal government provides the funding for situations like this but the province has to step up. The province has to step up, um, and that's what we have to go after the province. Um, the former council, the last term's council, is, was well aware of the situation. Mayor LeMay took the lead on it. He regularly briefed council. Staff have worked very diligently, Mr. Lewis, Ms. McLaughlin, and staff, and I commend them for that. Um, it's not a matter, you'll hear from Mr. Lewis tonight, it's not a matter of just going on the property and planting some trees. There's legal issues, there's, uh, you know, liability, there's steps you have to go through. Um, I, I would wish that, you know, we all drive down in the car tomorrow to Doug Ford and say we need some money. But, you know, the way government works, when I met with uh, Ms. Costello and Mr. Hyde, a few weeks ago, um, you know, they told me the mayor was coming and then we talked about the letter. And when I met John Yakubuski in Toronto, I said, expect a letter from the mayor and Mr. Lewis requesting some action. So the letter has been sent and the mayor is going to follow up. And uh, we go through the mayor. He's the head, the head of the council and uh, staff. And we know we have to get some action on it. So we're all uniform. We all agree. So now we have to go after the province, and uh, that's where it stands. So things have been working behind the scene on it, and uh, we need to work quicker and uh, more effectively. So I assume we'll be getting an answer from uh, the ministry within a few weeks, and the mayor will act accordingly. Thank you. So again, from council, thank you very much for attending this evening and bringing your concerns and letting everyone know uh, a little more information about what's happening on Moffitt Street. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mayor, and Councillors. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Good. Really appreciate your time. Really do. Thank you. All right, next up in the next delegation is the PBA Community Art Project. Mr. Unruh. Yeah, so tonight we have uh, Stacy Taylor, uh, the PBIA Board Chair who's in attendance that will speak to us about an exciting community art project.
Um, thank you everyone for having me here tonight. Um, so I'm here, I'm the current chair of the downtown Pembroke uh, business improvement area. And uh, with me I actually have our new vice chair, Renee Rodblatt. She's also the owner of DOT downtown. Um, so we're here, I'm here tonight to present um, an amazing initiative that the PBIA has planned for the downtown and for our community as a whole. It's not only about creating traffic and economic growth to our downtown businesses, but to also create a positive and inviting experience for all. We want to provide a platform for memory making that will impact our residents and inspire our youth and in turn be a part of what attracts them back to our area in the future. Um, do I just say next slide? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Next slide. Um, okay. So my teenager told me not to read from the slides, but I'm probably going to read from the slides. Um, so the community art garden is an opportunity to, for us to add some vibrancy to our downtown while promoting community spirit. The basic concept involves community organizations and members creating art on large canvases that the PBIA will display in our downtown. The art would be on display from the end of June until Thanksgiving weekend. And this project was inspired by Central, the Central Huron BIA. Um, they have an award-winning artist, Ali, which saw 180 paintings created by local community members and artists. Um, uh, you can't see over Ian's head. <laughs> of all ages. Uh, and their project actually ran for two summers. Um, so just a quick background on the, the reason they did their project was they had some major Main Street um, renovate or construction going on during COVID. So not only COVID, but no sidewalks, no streets. Uh, so they were encouraging their their customers or clientele to use the back alley to access whatever businesses they could. The back alley was not pretty, so they, with the help from the city, they cleaned up the alley, they did these beautiful art, uh, and they installed it, and it was a huge hit. So they actually, uh, Central Huron BIA actually won the, um, the OBIA, which is the Ontario Business Improvement Area Association, award uh, in 2022 for this project for Streetscaping and Public Realm Improvement Award uh, for their downtown destination uh, development. So, um, so why do we want to do this? Um, well, the Art Garden directly supports the PBIA strategic plan and our mission to enhance and beautify the downtown. Uh, it makes it more attractive to the tourists as well as more appealing to our residents. Um, it's a low-cost project that directly supports the city's strategic plan as well uh, regarding the development of outdoor spaces as it promotes healthy living, enhances our outdoor space, and encourages tourism to the city of Pembroke. Uh, this project would provide a barrier-free artistic opportunity for those in our community. And um, public art represents an important cultural contribution for the community as well as a positive economic impact. Thank you. Uh, next one. So how do we plan on doing this, doing this project? Um, we're looking to partner with local sponsors to provide plywood, paint, and supplies. We're going to reach out to community members, local groups, churches, and schools to create art for the garden. We say garden because it's an art garden. Um, the PBIA staff, uh, board members, and volunteers will work together to ensure a successful outcome and implementation of the project. And then once it's installed, the PBIA, as well as the City of Pembroke, can feature the art garden and artist bios on their websites and socials. So when Central Huron did it, um, they had like a full, it was like a full library of photo, a quick write up about the artist. So, you know, Susie in kindergarten's grandma's camp came to town, they could see it on online and then they would go down and it would generate that out of town foot traffic. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things we did see this past weekend with the community expo was with all the performers and everything was a lot of families came to watch their kids and, and to support their family members. So we're hoping that this would uh, have that same kind of driving force behind it as well so um, so our goal is to create an art destination that will attract residents and visitors to the downtown and our we're hoping to see at least 50 pieces uh, that would be completed and displayed um, we want to create partnerships with community members local groups churches and businesses and of course we want to continue to create a vibrant downtown enhance our outdoor spaces and provide memory making opportunities that will contribute to a shared sense of community in our city so that is what our goal is for the art garden. And that's all I'm here to let you guys know that we plan on uh, doing this little, little project in the downtown and hopefully you guys will be supportive of that. Uh, Councillor Keel. I couldn't be more excited to see this get off the ground. This I is, so nervous. this is, <laughs> um, I mean, this is, first of all, the Ottawa Valley is full of massive artistic talent. 
um, and to give uh, you know to give everyone an opportunity to showcase um, some of their more visual arts uh, uh, talent. I mean, that's a great idea. Um, I got to tell you, and I know some people have mixed feelings about this, but even when some of the skate park um, began to get painted in an appropriate way, that blast of color when you're driving through downtown, which like most downtowns, they're brick buildings, cement streets, cement sidewalks, that blast of color honestly adds uh, to a positive feeling when you're driving through downtown. Um, I very much look forward to this. I personally have no artistic uh, creativity whatsoever, um, but I couldn't be more supportive of this. Um, this is this is such a great idea. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Stacy. And sitting on, on the PBA, um, it's uh, it's a real, it's a wonderful project. As Councilor Kill said, you know, I'm I always say destination events. This is another one. Can you comment on two things? Uh, this is another example of PBA bringing people to the city at no cost to the city. Mm -hmm. This PBA is going to have a budget if needed yes. for this. Yep. And also, it's the art's not going to be in just one spot, right? Like Shamrock Park, you have other locations uh, you're going to ask other property owners? Um, so right now we're looking at a few different locations downtown. But Thea prepared me with answers, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> she's not here today. So well, you know I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So we're looking at a few different lo locations in the downtown. Uh, some of them are privately owned land, and uh, once we have a better idea of the amount of space that we're going to need, uh, we may eventually be coming to council with and ask for permission to use some of the public spaces. But we're I'll be honest, we had, a, we had a space in mind, but we're kind of on hold with that one just um, temporarily. And then uh, once we once we see what's happening, then we'll move forward right. from there. And when you supplementary question to the chair, what did we say at the meeting, the expected, uh, when are you going to start the promotion to advertise um, asking for artists? Yep. So, um, well, for asking for artists, I'm not sure Bithia's timeline on that, but um, she is going to be having a sponsorship package available Hopefully within the next week or so when she gets back from holidays. I think Levi's going to be working on the sponsorship package uh, in her absence. So That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So we'd like to have it. We'd love to have it set up by end June, I believe is what we said. Right. So, there, so if anyone has like, drills. Like, yeah. You know, well, Councillor Jagano, we <laughs> talked about we might build some more garden uh, boxes at the community garden, but he's got a better drill than the mayor. Well, there you or, go. Because the mayor's drill go. conked out last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, a, that's another thing, too, is, is if you guys are part of different community organizations that you think might be interested in either participating through helping put it together, put it up, or um, simply just doing some artwork, uh, that's definitely an opportunity for community organizations as well. So well, This is something the Youth Council, Councillor Frenny, could look into. Yeah. Okay, I have Councillor Frenny. Well, I was going to say where, but uh, <laughs> I, the Deputy Mayor asked. So um, yeah. are you going to have those pieces of art all available for purchase as well that's a great question I, I we think, never thought of that but yeah because um, i think it's a great venue for these yeah, artists or who knows if i saw a really nice piece and wanted to buy it right i think there should maybe be something on those websites or okay. i don't know how you would i'm not know. sure how that would work we'll have to talk about that at our next uh, at our next meeting yeah. and, and look into that as, a, as an idea i'm not sure how well they will weather by the time October comes. So that was my next. Uh, that was question, my next. Yeah. Was are they going to be taken in at night or is that? Late no. Night? They'll, so, once they're up, they'll be up. Um, okay. the, the way that Central Huron did it was um, they actually encouraged people to use um, old paint that they had at home or they had it donated, like mist tints from you know maybe Home Depot or Dulux or, or whoever. Um, so, so and then damage, the, yeah. So eventually, I imagine it would weather a little bit. Uh, the artists are more than welcome to go back and touch up as well okay. if they choose to before. Um, before Thanksgiving weekend. I believe theirs was up for most of the year. Like you'll see the picture There's behind snow there. back That's there. There's snow. Gonna, so yeah. um, I'm not sure how, I don't know that it would handle a, um, a Pembroke winter. Mm -hmm. Central Huron's a little bit warmer, I yeah. think. Um, so so yeah, we'll, we would have to see, but I would definitely keep it open that the artists are more than welcome to come back and do touch-ups if they okay. feel like they need to do that. Thank yep. you, I love yep. this, I love this. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Purcell. Oh, thanks Stacey for your presentation. Is there any consideration in terms of using like Centennial Park for that type of, and, and I think it just brought up another kind of a, just a point is in regards to the paint. Um, I know that there's um, surplus paints uh, are brought to the waste recovery centers and an opportunity to look at 
um, utilizing some of the paints there and coordinating with the uh, race recovery centers, you know, hey, look at, we're using recycled materials mm -hmm. um, to do these types of things. And um, I know that there's all kinds of paint out there. <laughs> yeah. They're, Free for the taking. They're definitely. <laughs> yeah. um, so we, we have looked at a few uh, different parks um, that we would be interested in using. Um, but Thea would be better at giving you reasons why we are or are not um, definitely looking at some of those. Um, again, we have, a, we have a prime spot that we really like, but we have a backup plan as well. So we're kind of just holding off to see what happens with that. <laughs> so, um, so location is a little up in the air, but it will definitely happen somewhere. Uh, and if we did it throughout the downtown, we have a couple spots that we know need some beautification. So hopefully with some support from um, some property owners, we can, we can try to make those spots look a little bit more appealing as well. So that's a goal. As for the, uh, the Waste Recovery Center paint, I'm not sure, usually when I take my paint to the Waste Recovery Center, yeah. there is no using that stuff because it's been in the garage through yeah. a couple winters. Um, it's pretty chunky, but, um, but definitely it's something to look into. Originally we had talked about using all recycled materials um, with regards to using like the plywood boards and everything. Then we came into the, the different quality of it. So if it was really weathered, then it's not gonna last as long. Um, so we were, we were hoping to either get a donation or, or, or sponsorships to, to help recover the cost of the actual fresh, fresh wood, uh, just for longevity of the project itself, so. It's just that I think, you know, Centennial Park, it's, uh, I feel it's underutilized and if we can kind of draw some people down there to look at the art installations, it might be a, a better, uh, a better use of that. Uh, that okay, area. which one is Centennial Park? Just <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's the one with the, uh, with the water fountain. With the water so we did actually talk about doing uh, that one. Uh, Shamrock always comes up and it gets used a lot, which is great for Shamrock Park. Um, this one doesn't get used a lot. We, we were a little bit concerned about uh, presenting it as an option just due to the stair, um, the current staircase uh, issues. Um, but that is definitely a spot that we would be happy to uh, happy to install some artwork in if um, if council approved of that and there was no concerns with regards to stairs. So more to follow. Okay. Councilor Jackano. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, you're so enthusiastic, <laughs> and you're talking about our town, not uh, somebody else's town. Our town, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you've been paying back ever since. I think the city kind of gave you a bit of a help, it a did. hand up. Yep. And you haven't stopped. I know. So thank you for that. It's exhausting. <clears throat> I have one question. <laughs> well, don't, don't <laughs> but stop. But in a good but, way. But yeah. anyway, yes, yeah. it's good for everyone. Art does attract people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the opportunity many years ago to see the Mona Lees in the Louvre. Mm -hmm. I always want to see it. And in my mind, I always pictured it as being three feet across by four feet wide, mm -hmm. you know, or, or deep. It's 12 by 10. It, you know, it's something, it's a little wee, it's the size of this, <laughs> you know, and uh, I couldn't believe I said the Mona Lisa. But art uh, creates expectations with people mm -hmm. and it will draw people. Yep. But I just had a question. You, you sure. had a, a statement there, barrier free. You mean barrier free to the artist or barrier free for observation? Well, ultimately for observation as well as, I mean, we want people to be able to, to access it yeah. regardless. So that is definitely yeah. something we would keep in mind regardless of where we're gonna install it. Okay. But it's barrier free for the artists as well. So we, there's no cost involved to them. So a lot of people who might be hindered by not having, having the funds to support the, this type of a hobby <coughs> or this type of a project at home themselves, because we're providing the supplies, um, there's, no, there's no cost barrier for them. Um, the goal is that we would actually be able to provide them if they choose to, um, the materials at their home. So they can even paint in their, in their yep. garage or in their yard or where, wherever they work. So, uh, so a few different barriers. The only reason yeah. I was asking barrier free, because yep. a lot of artists, you don't want to present their interpretation of what they see, mm -hmm. but is it tasteful, you know, to children or to people? I mean, oh. there is that, that, that's where I was coming from. I mean, if it, you know, if, yeah. it, if it hits you between the eyes and you say, wow, you know, I wouldn't show that to my granddaughter. Right. Why would it be on display in our park? Right. And that, that's my only question. I just had a concern about that. And I'm not against free expression. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good thing, but in the right venue. Correct, and that is something that we did talk about as well. And um, while we don't want to put out restrictions because art is is you know freedom of expression, uh, we would when it gets to those questionable moments, um, I think we would definitely be vetting uh, the artwork. So I, I think even having a conversation with the artists, uh, whether it's in advance or or as the artwork was created, uh, if there's something that's a little offside, I'm sure we'll we'll vet that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> 
Seeing no further comments, then thank you very much for coming and presenting a very uh, exciting idea for Pembroke. Right. Thank you so much for having me. Good. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. New business, Disaster Mitigation Adoption Fund, um, Office Street Soap Civility. Mr. Lewis, welcome to the table this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Operations Department seeks the direction of Council on the submission of an application to the Federal Government under the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, DMAF, to help address the Moffat Street slope stability issues or possibly to fund a city-owned outfill rehabilitation project. So we had a great presentation earlier this evening from uh, Mr. Hyde and um, uh, Ms. Costello and I'll try and further some of that information for Council as I go through my report. So issues with the instability of the slopes along the two rivers that cross through the city have been ongoing for years. And as mentioned earlier, this is not just a case in the City of Pembroke. As a matter of fact, I was a teen at the time when the slopes uh, failed in the Township of Laurentian Valley. Um, and they are continuing uh, as recent as the last couple weeks. They've had additional slides in that municipality as well. <clears throat> there has been other evidence of locations of slides over the years in the City of Pembroke. So Moffat's Point, as we call it, is not the only location where we've had slides um, that have happened throughout the city. You may remember the Draper Street Sanitary Sewer failure that happened a number of years ago. We ended up with a temporary lift station at the end of Draper Street for a number of years. Uh, we just recently did the Draper to Dominion Sanitary Sewer that effectively negated the issue of the slides that happened several years ago in that location. Um, almost identical to what has happened at Moffat's Point is something that uh, operations has been dealing with for decades. Um, so as uh, Mr. Hyde and Ms. Costello mentioned, the floods and the severe weather of 2017 and 2019 exasperated the issues of the stability of the slopes and significant slope failures did occur. With some government assistance through the federal programs, uh, various federal programs, the city has done work on the issues. Uh, and I mentioned some of the other work that we did. Uh, we did an outfall replacement that was affected by the slides off of River Road. Um, not far from the operations department. We continue to do ongoing protection of traffic protection and road works along the edges of the banks of the rivers uh, where our roads are close to that. Um, so that's an ongoing thing. We are aware of Lita Clay within the city of Pembroke. A number of locations, not just at Moffat's Point, there's a number of other locations and I agree that saturation and shearing of Lita clay is a, a very serious issue. Um, we've looked at a number of different things that we can try to mitigate the Lita clay in various different areas of the city. Uh, I would caution sometimes draining that type of material isn't always the best. You take the, the liquid out of the Lita clay, it tends to shrink and it can cause other issues on top of sliding. I'm not saying that it wouldn't be an option at, uh, at Moffat's Point, but it needs to be uh, considered. So under the National Disaster Mitigation Program, a study was completed uh, on Moffat's Point. It assessed the stability of the existing slopes along Moffat Street and provided some stabilization alternatives. That program was extended. And with that, the city completed design and tender ready documents for slope stabilization of the worst affected areas, not all the areas but those that are deemed the worst by the study. Continuing with that NDM program, an opportunity under another stream was brought to committee on June 16th of 2020 to construct the mitigation measures designed. And again, as was discussed earlier, uh, it was a $20 million project, um, minimum $20 million project to get the federal contribution of 40%. Uh, based on that maximum $12 million contribution from the City of Pembroke would have been required. That didn't necessarily look after all the problems. That was just to meet the minimum requirements of the grant. And at that time, direction was received not to proceed with an application. The City has expended uh, roughly $200,000 
um, on the Moffitt's Point issues. There was a 50% contribution from the NDMP program for that. We have done planning design for the works on private properties. And that $200,000 doesn't include the various outfall works and other studies and specifically the sanitary sewer failure repairs and, and those type of uh, mitigation measures that we've done along the years. Staff and representatives of council have taken delegations to Roma, Amel, Good Roads, requesting consideration for the Moffat Street slope stability, as well as the new, uh, the new buzz that is uh, climate change affecting us is the inland flooding and, and additional storm outfalls. Um, with climate change, with the severe weather that we're seeing, the significant rainfalls, it's not just slope instabilities or, or properties along the river's edge that's causing us grief. Um, inland flooding is causing property damage and infrastructure damage as well. So further to delegations, uh, I personally appeared at several def delegations, prepared and presented several delegations along with uh, elected members of council. I personally attended, as did Ms. McLaughlin with, with Minister Clark on Moffat's Point, uh, and discussed the issues and begged for help. Um, additional to the slope instability, so as I mentioned, uh, in addition to the slope instability, climate change is causing us grief uh, regarding significant weather, inland flooding and stormwater management. So the city has applied and was successful in funding for a risk assessment, which looked at inland flooding and review of some of the city's storm outfalls. The study provided an assessment of those areas of concern and did provide some design and remedial works at some outfalls. So the operations department has got a big fork with a lot of tines off of it, if I'm saying it right. And the two regarding stormwater management is Moffat's Point, the slides along the Indian River and the Muskrat River, as well as all our inland flooding and other stormwater management issues to deal with, with uh, climate change. Several city storm outfalls are deficient or have already failed. And the consultant has recommended remedial actions Outfall number 56, number 42, number 31 are specifically included in the study and in needing remediation. Outfall number 68 beside the PCC has been undermined. It's threatening the PCC and the neighboring property. Just got pictures just the other day from the supervisor at the PCC. The outfall there is uh, causing us some extreme risk and liabilities. So that is an outfall that needs to be addressed immediately. Additionally, for inland flooding concerns, we are all aware that the storm surcharging on Angus Campbell Drive damaged the roadway and removed a very large section of asphalt that happened ju just a few years back. We've got low areas in the city that have significant concerns related to stormwater management when the severe weather hits us. So the new program that's out, Part of the National Adaption Strategy, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, being named DMAF, receives an additional approximately $490 million over the next 10 years. That's federal funding. According to the program details, projects uh, being described that may meet the requirements, municipalities are eligible. Projects must have a minimum $1 million in total eligible cost, so a big change from the previous program where you had to have a minimum of $20 million. Property acquisition is eligible for funding, but not if the intent is to relocate residents, purchase dwellings, buildings, or equipment. Land acquisition for the development of nat natural in infrastructure could be included as an eligible exp expenditure as long as it's not the sole component. And the reason I'm hinging on property to effectively do work on Moffat's Point, the city would have to purchase a portion of everyone's property that work was going to be done on. Otherwise, it's not considered municipal work. So at the back of everyone's property, the city would have to look at purchasing a portion where the works are going to attend on. We would have to own that property before we could do the work. There would be all the the legalities of purchasing all those properties, uh, the surveys that would be required for purchasing those properties, and then the work, and afterwards we would continue to own that property. It would be considered infrastructure now on city-owned property, which we would have to look at maintaining forever, 
with all the liabilities attached to additional infrastructures. So I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, back to the program, the maximum federal contribution is 40%. The deadline for applications is July 19th of 2023. So speaking of budget, there's no budget identified in the for construction activities in the city's multi-year capital construction forecast for the Moffat Street Slope Stability. Currently, the designed Moffat Street Slope Stability project is approximately $30.7 million, as Councillor Lafernier had mentioned earlier. That's based on the 2019 estimates, and I've included the CPI just to bring it up to uh, 2023 numbers. Federal contribution is roughly $12.128 million, 40%, and a municipal or ratepayer contribution would be 18.42 million because as of now there is no provincial financial contribution expected and that doesn't include remediation of city infrastructure that's just concentrating on the private properties <clears throat> and the slope instability that related to Moffat's point it doesn't include anything at the end of Norman Street it doesn't include anything off of McGee Street um, Doran any of those locations or any city infrastructure. That's just the private properties along Moffat's Point that was part of that study, uh, if I'm remembering it correctly. Regarding the inland flooding and city storm outfall, there's $150,000 in this year's budget to repair storm outfall 68. That's the one I mentioned at the PCC. It goes into the Ottawa River. Um, so we do have $150,000 in the budget for that. The anticipated cost for upgrades to the undersized stormwater collection system in the area of Melton Street and Angus Campbell Drive. Repairs to outfalls 56, 42, 31, and potential upgrades to other outfalls is in the magnitude of five to six million dollars. And I can be honest, that's a very high level estimate. There's no designs in place. There's been no proposals put together on what the mitigation measures would be. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to understand the city's infrastructure woes at this time regarding stormwater management in the magnitude of five to six million. Storm sewer and outfall projects can be bundled under one application, so it doesn't have to be one specific area. We can take an outfall there and an outfall at the other side of town and, and we could put them together in one application. With the federal 40% uh, contribution, it's anticipated the city's contribution for a project doing, dealing with our outfalls would be in the magnitude of 3.7 million, and the program does run for nine years. Deadline for application again is July 19th, 2023. And if successful uh, in securing funny, funding, all the work has to be completed by December 31st of 2032. Mr. Chair, I will require direction should committee wish the department to proceed with work to formulate an application, get all the required backup information together, provide cost estimates, work plans, schedules, so that we can submit a substantial application that would have the merits of receiving funding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Deputy Mayor. Um, before I make a motion, um, make two motions actually. Um, so can you reiterate why we can't put a barge behind Lee Costello's house and put in some fill rock from seagull sand and gravel or McRae's and build up a tow berm and all that. What, we can't do that ourselves because that would have been done in 2017, right? I would anticipate in 2017 and in 2019 after the slides initially happened, there would have been a call for action and, and we would have been on site actioning everything we possibly could. If the funds were available, if it was a practical project that wasn't going to create issues down the road. So putting a barge into the river and tossing some granular materials against the bank, as Mr. Hyde uh, discussed, is not going to solve the problem. There needs to be a significant, significant support structure built in the river to support that, that bank. Um, it needs to be designed correctly. There needs to be all sorts of mitigation measures that, that go along with the construction activities alone. Due diligence studies, we're dealing with butternut trees, species at risk. Uh, we're in water. 
The Department of Fisheries and Oceans need to be involved. Uh, there are fish in that river. We need to deal with those type of things, all those kind of things. It's not a simple toss some material up against the bank. The other thing that needs to be understood is if you've got 30 feet of or 40 feet of embankment that is moving and you only build 10 or 12 feet out of the river to support it, you're going to support that 12, 10 to 12 feet. As lead clay or clay of this type shears, the top portion could still shear. So you've got to do a significant amount of work on the embankment right into people's backyards. Otherwise, you haven't accomplished anything. The other issue to, concern, to be concerned about is if you take one area that presently has slides, affected by slides, and you correct that one area and don't do anything adjacent to it, years from now, it's just going to happen again. It's going to work its way around. So everything ne needs to be done in a very, very um, engineered and systematic way or it's not going to be as beneficial or as helpful as we would like. Proof in point, in the neighboring municipality right now, they're dealing with slides that have happened right beside, I mean, a foot beside work that was completed a number of years ago, the exact same work we're referring to, and the slide has just now moved. It took a number of decades to do that because I was a teen at the time and I'm no longer a teen. Um, but the slides have just moved. So there is a lot of concern. There's liabilities involved. It is private property. We can't just go in and start doing work on private property. Um, and the liabilities and all those those type of things, hence why we haven't done any any of that work. Okay. So, okay, thank you. So the first motion is the council supports uh, the mayor and staff, CEO and staff, continue to uh, advocate for the residents of the Moffitt Street situation and advocate for provincial funding. That's the first motion. Because that, that's, what you're looking, that's one of the things you're looking for direction, right? What I'm specifically looking for direction for is, uh, does committee and council wish the operations department to work forward on an application um, for this, this new program? That's the direction that I would need. Okay, uh, so I'm not saying that the direction you're providing okay. isn't, isn't working. So I'll change that. the second motion is I'll forget about that one for now. We'll deal with that after. Um, I think from the previous presentation, we've given direction to the mayor and CEO to continue to lobby for the provincial funding and follow up in the letter. The motion would be to to uh, go ahead and apply for the funding for the DMAF program for the outfalls. Okay. Question? Councillor Frenny? If we apply for the funding and get it, but we still haven't received any any action from the provincial or any money, can we decide then if how to proceed, or do we have to, we're, we're not committed? In other words, if we get it right uh, through the chair, mm -hmm. if I understand um, Deputy Mayor Abdallah's motion, city staff would work on uh, submitting an application for the outfall por outfall project, mm -hmm. not the Moffitt's Point project but for the other outfalls and the inland flooding issues that we're dealing with. Um, if we were successful in our application we would be told the 40 percent is this value you have to come up with your other 60 percent. If we were unable to come up with our other 60 percent we don't accept the grant. We thank them and thank you. On. Thank you. I'll yeah. second the motion. Country Kill. Question then if we included the protection of the private works would the same theory apply that we could apply and see what we can get from the feds and then see if we can get the province at the table would the same theory apply through you mr chair yes i would agree the same theory would apply we'd be looking at a um off the top of my head 36 to 40 45 million dollar project together asking for 40 cents the concern would be do we have the merit to be successful in the application do we have the funding available and can we show that we have funding available to support that project knowing that we're only going to get 40 percent from the federal government so in applications of this nature um, 
you know, in decades I've been working for the city and, and doing applications, one of the key things to, to inform those you're applying to, so to the program people, is where are you getting your share? If you don't have an understanding of where you're getting your share, it makes it very difficult to be successful. I caution whether or not combining the two, let's call them two separate projects, combining the two separate projects is going to be a successful application, or would we be more successful with two separate? Mm -hmm. to, so they could be separate. They could be separate. Two applications could be submitted. We could uh, do two separate applications. Understanding that's a significant amount of work. Think about that. Let other councils, councillors talk. Um, Worship. Uh, just to uh, build upon what Mr. Lewis is saying, I know at one of the delegations, uh, the minister's staff was very quick uh, when we were <laughs> discussing our ass. Uh, they were very quick to say, "Okay, so if you're looking for X number of million, that would mean you need X number of million." And it was very quick that the, you could see the the wheels turning that they wanted to know where our contribution was coming from. They were. They were very, they, they do consider it because they bluntly asked us. So that's the first piece. Uh, the second one is a question for Mr. Lewis. I'm just wondering if you can, uh, if you have any wisdom in terms of uh, when a municipality, like what is the risk if a municipality applies for a grant and then later says uh, we don't have our funding or what have you and we don't want to proceed or can't proceed is probably more appropriate. Uh, through the chair. The risk is in future grants. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily a risk into that grant apl application itself because you've turned down the money, you've thanked them very much and you know, sent off a nice letter, if I can be blunt. Um, the risk would be in future applications when you're putting significant amount of work into an application, are they going to look at it and say, last time you walked away from it, they, we, we may not be taken as seriously the next time around. Uh, they may look at our information through a different lens, if I can say it that way, um, as, they, as they go through our applications. It could hurt future applications. <coughs> Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd be prepared to support the motion <clears throat> uh, pending the mayor's uh, leadership uh, in talking to the province or perhaps to the premier himself. There may be some other outcomes from that. Uh, and whoever's speaking to the provincial uh, legislators, they may want to talk about species at, re at risk, the redfin sucker and the butternut tree, but one of the greatest species at risk are the residents living on Moffat Street. So there's got to be some commitment to human life as opposed to you know, wildlife that can be replanted or fish that can be restocked. Once a person's gone and dead, you can't restock that person. So I think that's got to be uh, more than evident in the discussion, and it should uh, it should move forward. But I'd be prepared to uh, to support the motion. And as you said, you know, if uh, if we back away, your credibility level is zero. Uh, next time you apply, they say, well, maybe they're just fooling again and just wasting our time. So we'll go with the municipality who's got some background, has got some money, is willing to proceed. So I think we have to be cautious uh, when we're doing that and, uh, you know, in refusing something. But I mean, if you don't have the money, but you're planning for the future to try and help somebody, then by all means, I think we have to go full steam ahead. Uh, Councillor Purcell. Uh, three different options that we have on the table right now. One is to do nothing, and there's risks and liability of doing nothing. Uh, the second is to continue to lobby for the provincial funding, and the third is to do the two separate applications for the DMAF and for the outfalls and the uh, and the private uh, property uh, mitigation of the slopes. Um, Mr. Lewis, I guess is um, is it possible uh, to create like an easement? in terms of a slope uh, stabilization easement to allow that work to happen behind, uh, just to make it a little bit easier in terms of performing that work activities? Through you, Mr. Chair, I would suggest an easement is, is likely not going to fulfill the requirements of uh, the grant program. They're very specific in the information provided in the program brief 
that the municipality must own the property, hence why they go into such detail in what that means about owning property, what you can purchase and what not. So we would actually have to own that portion. In some properties, it may not be a lot that we would need mm -hmm. to own, depending on how much work needed to be up top. Um, seeing the latest information from uh, Ms. Costello's property, uh, we could own significant amount of her backyard just to try and get that work complete. Uh, we cannot work on private property. Okay. Um, so, so I guess because of the, um, the funding is available over a 10 year period, um, so, so we're probably looking at about three to four million dollars per year over the 10 years, right? And then what is the, what are the risks of doing nothing? The houses collapse into the river eventually people de vacate their homes yeah. um, we lose maybe some infrastructure um, associated with the city um, you know what there's a lot of people that are impacted there and if you look at that uh, map there's a lot of um, red areas that, that I've like I said that I've visited um, and I guess the other thing is you know the trees that are falling into the rivers are causing some issues as well because they haven't been cleaned up so they're acting like dams and actually causing some some more erosion of the banks as well um, in certain areas um, and I know that was a topic of discussion uh, that I had with many residents is that something that maybe the city could look at assisting you know these you know these these residents in regards to cleaning up the river so that to allow um, this debris not to accumulate and then cause additional erosion and bank instability? Through you, Mr. Chair, years and years ago, um, the city did have a program where we went on ice and tried to deal with some of the trees that had come down. Uh, health and safety being what it is, WSIB and mm -hmm. um, Ontario Health and Safety Association, uh, the requirements are so large that it doesn't make it practical to do that anymore. We would have to hire a contractor to come in uh, and work from the river levels. I would anticipate the ministry's requirements would be very stringent considering the species at risk, uh, working in, um, in water works, uh, all of that kind of stuff. It's possible, yes. It could be quite costly. Mm -hmm. um, and. I understand, I do understand that when you have debris in the river, it can create um, um, currents and so forth that can cause further erosion. The other thing that sometimes debris in a river might do is slow down the water a little bit. So when we have that, that runoff in the spring and water is moving so quickly, if it's held back a little bit in certain locations, it can help to slow down some of the river. Um, I'm not saying that's happening. I'm not saying that it's beneficial right now. I haven't uh, observed it from, from that focus, mm -hmm. um, but it can happen sometimes. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor. So yeah, th this motion specifically deals with the, I see five outfalls that are having issues yeah. and uh, before I comment, uh, Mr. Lewis, the Melton Street and Angus Campbell, the, the outfall in Angus Campbell blew up. That was last year, right? When the torrential downpour? Within the last couple of years. Yeah. My memory is failing me as to whether or not it was last summer, but it, it was, was definitely before. within the last couple of okay. years. And that, that isn't what we call an outfall. That's uh, one part of our storm sewer collection right. system. But it was definitely due to undersized storm sewer mm -hmm. uh, based on the severe weather we get and a surcharging that created that. Right. So we were in Toronto April uh, 18th. We had the delegation, you, you and me, and you and I and Ms. McLaughlin, and we heard from the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure. And their comment was um, how much have the feds, uh, how much is the federal government promising? And once you get money from them, you know, we might have some money. And you, you gave them a very detailed presentation on the aquatic complex and the stormwater management issue and the challenges all across Ontario. So it's imperative that we apply for this funding for these outfalls and um, 
you know, hopefully get the funding and then maybe we can, if the province comes up with the program, or we can go to them and say, we're getting this from the feds, how much can you contribute? But it's definitely worth a while to apply for the funding. And uh, as Councillor uh, Purcell mentioned, you know, we also continue to lobby for the, the, the Moffitt Street fund if the province needs to come forward, but we've, we've talked about that. So it's imperative that we deal with this infrastructure challenge, so it's going to get worse. Councillor Kill. Two questions. One, where are we getting the money for our outfall contribution? And number two, have we creatively explored any other options with respect to Moffat Street? Like whether or not we can um, find any private contributions if any, uh, if any of the construction companies working were to... Uh, were to provide certain works for free, would we be able to issue charitable receipts for their companies? Have we looked at this in terms of turning over every possible rock that could possibly be found? No pun intended for this topic that we're talking about. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair, not from my desk. I'm not aware of, of any... Um, soul searching or, or rock turning um, to try and come up with donations or anything of that nature. Um, one discussion that did happen a while back was a uh, local area improvement project where the ratepayers contribute to the, the remediation efforts uh, and potentially it gets added to their taxes and they pay over a period of time. Um, that was discussed briefly. But with the minimal number of contractors that are in the area um, and the sig significant amount of work that's happening in the area, especially in the last couple of years, um, where there's a backlog created from COVID, I don't anticipate there would be any contractors available that would be willing to come in and, and work for free. Um, but in answer to your question, no, we have not, uh, we have not started that background work. And then what was your first question, Councillor Keeley? Oh, where, where are we getting our contribution to the outfall uh, costs? At this, at this point in time, it's not included in the, uh, in the budget for 2023, of course. We would be looking at our multi-year capital construction forecast and moving projects around appropriately. There is storm sewer funds in the 20-year program uh, with storm sewer works, so we would prioritize those existing storm sewer projects to move around to the outfalls that needed it. And as mentioned through my report, um, it's a 10 year program. So we have the opportunity to potentially put money in reserves over the next three, four, five years to build for a project should the project deem it more appropriate. If we didn't do one outfall a year, so to speak, and we wanted to do all three outfalls at one time because it was going to be more effective and efficient, we could bank some money until such time and then have our funds available at that point in time. That's part of the scheduling and the planning that needs to go into the application so that we can tell the uh, program um, staff exactly how we see the program going and where we're going to need the funds. Um, their applications also, the review of applications also take into account who's going to need money where and when. Supplementary, are you done? You look deep in thought. If someone else has a comment, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be entertained to speak from the chair. Just, Councillor, or sorry, <laughs> Mr. Lewis. From the deadline of application of July 19th, how, as you said, it takes quite extensive time to apply for projects. How much time would you need? Say if, hypothetically, the mayor was able to knock on the premier's door and they come to the table with money, prior application, in June sometime, how long would you need to provide an, uh, to detailed application for Moffitt Street? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Doing the Moffat Street project second to the the um, inland and the storm outfalls would be easier for staff to deal with. 
because we've got all that background information. We've got the studies available to us. We've got estimates that we could update. Um, we've got some planning and, and some scheduling that's already dealt with, considering we've done so much work on, on Moffat's Point as it sits. Um, there would still be some work. I would like to consider uh, Mr. Hyde's suggestion of, of whether or not we can stage the project and potentially split it into, into smaller pieces. With that, it would take some work to, to confirm that. Um, in answer to your question, uh, myself and Ms. McLaughlin would probably be putting in a couple of days a week over the next, oh, for about three weeks to ensure that we got that application done properly to submit. So about three weeks from that period. I have a hand up at the back for the CAO. Yes, through you, Chair. Uh, um, <clears throat> I've been waiting to ask this question for a bit here. Um, so in regards to budget to put this application together, so if uh, you and staff are, are doing two to three days a week for a few weeks, what is the cost to the city? Off the top of my head, by the time we got that work completed, as well as the potential, we may need to bring the consultants in to update some estimates, help us with some scheduling and some planning. I would guess we're in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to do that application providing the kind of merit that it would need. So just a, just a follow up, like, and what would that put behind in regards to other projects that are already scheduled? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I would, off the top of my head, I'm, I can't pick a project, um, but other than the outfall at the PCC that needs to be dealt with immediately, I would suggest no other storm sewer works would um, would happen this year. As well, we would have some serious consideration of outfall 27 at the corner of Moffat Street and Margaret Street and how we were still going to address that situation that has yet to be completed. We may have to put that project off for a year as well. Okay, I have the Deputy Mayor to make comments first. So, looking for information. <clears throat> We, we can submit two separate applications to the feds, one for the outfall and one for Moffitt Street. Uh, as I understand the details <coughs> to date, yes, we could. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we got the, uh, the province came up with the money for the, and said, yes, we realize this is important. Uh, we're going to donate so much to the, and match the feds contribution or something like that, that could be a separate uh, application. Than this one. That's okay. Thank you. That's correct. Mr. Kiel. I move to amend the deputy mayor's motion to include a second uh, application for the uh, the private Moffat Street uh, slope stability. Deputy mayor, it's your motion. If you want to accept the addition of a second motion, now count second uh, application. That that could be a separate motion, Councillor Kiel. Because we can put in a separate application. This is for the outfalls. It, and, it, and I'm moving to amend your motion to include a second application. So if there's a seconder for that motion, we would then vote on whether to amend your motion. Councillor Purcell. So, uh, I'll second that. So to clarify. Clarify. Just from what the ta around the table here. We have a motion on the table originally to submit for the outfalls. Councillor Keels made a motion to amend the deputy's motion to add the additional application. Now, is that subject to retaining funding through the province? The, yeah, the idea that we're going to be hoping to get that funding. So we should have two applications. Two, uh, the, the second right. application. Okay, yeah. same as two motions. So I'll put the two together. That's fine. I'll, I'll give you that. So. Then the quick guys procedural we'll call the question. Those in favor of amending the deputy mayor's motion to include both applications, pass unanimously. So, reading a motion <laughs> from what I have, I have deputy mayor motioning that we submit two applications: one for the outfall yeah. and the second application for Moffat Street, based on if we receive funding from the province uh, to the D. I'm sorry, DMAF. Mr. DMAF fund. So, and any further comments or questions on that now? 
Seeing none, call the question those in favor. Approve unanimously. I hope that's enough <laughs> clarity for Mr. Lewis to submit some applications. I think I have it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. That was a big one. Next up, uh, Pemmer Street West Phase 4, tender contract number 20264-4. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll try and get through this one a little quicker. The Operations Department recommends the following. Committee approve award for the reconstruction of Pembroke Street West, Phase 4. Mamrishi Lodge to Christie Street, contract number 20-0264-4. To H and H Construction Inc. in the amount of one million five hundred ninety-nine thousand fourteen dollars and fifty-nine cents, plus HST, that being the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. Committee approve additional expenditures in the amount of eighty thousand dollars for contingency allowance. The total value of the recommendation equal one million six hundred seventy-nine thousand fourteen dollars and fifty-nine cents plus HST. So. Per our procurement policy, uh, we advertised and tendered. We received two bids. Um, they were reviewed by city staff as well as the consulting engineers. And the two bids that we received are as follows. H&H &H Construction Inc. at $1,599,014.59. Greenwood Paving Pembroke Limited at $1,634,620.70. As part of the 2023 capital budget, a budget of $1,050,000 was identified for the reconstruction of Phase 4. Project costs as tendered for the reconstruction, in including design, contract administration, construction, additional expenditures, and the net HST, is $1,765,598.06. That represents a budget shortfall of roughly $716,000. Phase three of Pembroke Street was completed in 2022 with some reductions in estimated quantities and we were lucky we only had to use a very small amount of contingency allowance. This amount along with some carry forward from the previous other phases of Pembroke Street West uh, represent just under $200,000 so the revised shortfall is $516,811.06. It can be funded with the remaining 2024 OSIF funding, which presently has a balance of 946000 And as normal, the uh, above includes contract administration award to McIntosh Perry Consulting Engineers so that they can do the contract administration on the project for us. And just a reminder, Pembroke Street West Phase 4 is the final phase of the multi-year project, partially funded by the federal and provincial governments under ICIP Northern and Rural Stream. And that saw Pembroke Street West resurfaced from the city western limits and will end at Christie Street, as well as upgrades and replacements to traffic signals, sidewalks, and AODA compliance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move that we proceed as recommended by staff with the shortfall coming from the OCIF funding. Deputy Mayor. Second the motion. Further question, comment? Seeing none, call the question those in favour. Approved. Next up, the 2020 Municipal Election Compliance Report. Uh, Clerk, Mr. Unrah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this report is for information only and is in accordance with the Municipal Elections Act. Uh, so as part of that, uh, we are supposed to report the selling out of all candidates in an election and indicating whether each candidate complied with Section 88.25 of the Municipal Elections Act. Uh, so in regards to um, notices, everything was supposed to be completed and filed by 2 p.m. on Friday, March 31st. Uh, two individuals did not uh, file at that time. They received a notice of default explaining the options to pay, and um, they were supposed to submit their financial statements prior to 2 p.m. on May 1st to avoid any penalties. Uh, both candidates failed to file their financial statements form four. All other election candidates complied with uh, Section 88.25 of the Municipal Elections Act. Any questions from Council as this information item? Councillor Purcell. 
Uh, just a comment for transparency. It is available on the City of Pembroke website under elections in terms of those um, complaints, uh, not the compliance reports, but the um, um, the reports for each candidate in terms of the um, the dollar spent for elections. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other comments, then we'll move on. Pembroke 50 Active Living Centre Lease Agreement. Mr. Unruh. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is uh, recommended that the attached lease agreement with the Pembroke 50 Plus Active Living Centre be approved. Uh, so the current uh, lease um, was uh, a four-year and it, it expires on May 31st, 2023. Um, and uh, so the recommendation is, is that we enter into uh, basically the same agreement. Uh, the only changes were that the uh, name be updated to Pembroke 50 plus Active Living Centre uh, and under use of space it referenced fire department and so that's changed to uh, City of Pembroke in general um, and that we uh, change the duration to five years rather than four years to avoid negotiating of the lease during election year um, and uh, the 50 plus active living center have reviewed the proposed changes and are in agreement. Councillor Keel. Is there a reason that I'm not aware of as to why we charge the senior center um, $1,100 and change in rent, but the grind $1? Mr. Unral, are you prepared to answer that? Uh, nope. In, in regards to the previous lease, in regards to the grind, I have no comment. Okay. Deputy Mayor? For information, uh, that's necessary to get their funding for the province. For the, the funding formula. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you had your hand up earlier for... Well, I'd motion to accept the lease. Okay. Councillor Keel? Second. Further questions? Seeing none, call the question. Those in favor? Approved. Bylaw before uh, council this evening. Uh, that's it. Motion adjourned. Councilor Keel, Deputy Mayor, we are adjourned.
Good evening. This is the Parks and Recreation Committee meeting for Tuesday, May 6th. I'd like to call it to order. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest in general nature thereof? Seeing none, could I have a motion to approve the amendment meeting agenda? Moved by Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Plummer. All in favor? Uh, the uh, minutes of the April 18th meeting have been circulated. Could I have a motion to approve? Moved by Councillor Purcell, Councillor Plummer. All in favor? Approved. Jordan, new business. Riverside Park Ball Diamond Number 4 scoreboard donation. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, so this report is just for uh, information uh, purposes only. Uh, so as council may be aware, uh, the scoreboard at uh, Riverside Park uh, Ball Diamond Number 4 um, is of course a, an aging asset and uh, was originally installed in 1989. Uh, the scoreboard uh, unfortunately has been creating a lot of malfunctions for users of the facility uh, over the past couple years, particularly with um, the electrical. Uh, with no capital investment to replace the scoreboard in 2023, a sponsorship opportunity had arisen through the support of uh, Bogies Bar. And uh, Bogies Bar is committed to supporting 100% of the costs associated with the new scoreboard, scoreboard project. Uh, the new scoreboard, which is a Nevco model 1630, uh, will feature white LED digits for visually impaired people. So this is uh, in line with accessibility, as well as a wireless handheld control and wireless receiver. So the size will remain the same. So it's 18 feet by eight feet and the color will be uh, royal blue. So we tried to pick something with a uh, city color. And of course, uh, finally, it will be installed on the existing infrastructure on ball diamond number four. So there'll be no additional cost there. Uh, the scoreboard was awarded to the scoreboard man, Paul S. Leskuel & Associates, Inc., and the total cost, including HST rebate, is $25,071.63 and has been exclusively sponsored by Bogies Bar. Thank you. Comments, questions, uh, Deputy Mayor? Well, through, through the chair uh, to Jordan, I just want to thank Bogies Bar. This is... This is phenomenal. I, I know they helped out with, they help out with many projects, you know, the the uh, splash pad at Riverside, and this is just fantastic. So thank you very much to Bogies Bar and all the volunteers. Well said. A, a quick question. In terms of this particular uh, company, uh, have we ever heard of this particular company before? I, I guess why I'm asking the question is we know that at the PMC, uh, previously a sign was, uh, was purchased and uh, soon we had issues, uh, as I understand it, the city of Pembroke, and it was difficulty getting getting it repaired, and then a new one ended up eventually need being needed to be purchased. So I guess what I'm just wondering is, is it's not something that's obsolete or close to being obsolete. I guess that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, through the chair, uh, no, absolutely not. So. Councillor Keel. Uh, in some ways, I'm going to echo uh, the deputy mayor's comments in, in saying that uh, you know these kinds of opportunities. Uh, I know Bogies Bar is uh, somewhat affiliated uh, um, with the city through its location at the PMC or whatnot. But the, these kinds of opportunities to give back, this is this is something that our parks have benefited from for a, a long period of time. And uh, certainly, I would encourage anyone with uh, with any ideas or any any thoughts about sponsoring things, uh, certainly to come forward and, and to speak with you in the Parks and Rec uh, Department. Um, I, do take, uh, I do take some negativity, though, suggesting that something in its 30s is an aging asset, though. Just uh... Okay, chuckle, chuckle. Um, <laughs> a Little League Ontario Senior Provincials. Uh, fee waiver request, Jordan? Thank you very much. So the recommendation for this report is that the Parks and Recreation Committee support the request for a fee waiver for the upcoming Little League Ontario Senior Provincial Ball Tournament, July 6th to the 10th at Riverside Park for reasons established in this report. Um, so of course, uh, uh, most recently our department received a letter from um, Upper Ottawa Valley Little League and this was a request to support a fee waiver for the upcoming Senior Provincials for Little League Ontario. And what's really important with this is that unfortunately in the last couple of years, our little leaguers haven't been able to, uh, to play in these types of tournaments, uh, mainly because of COVID. So it's something that's kind of uh, really sparking um, these opportunities uh, for us as well as the community. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to, to showcase um, our city through, um, through sports tourism. Uh, so it is estimated that approximately 30 to 40 hours of diamond use will occur, which basically translates into a fee waiver of uh, approximately six to $800. 
Um, just being prepared for this in addition, we do expect that there may be some additional labor that we would incur, but of course we would absorb it in our operational budget. Thank you. Mr. Keel? Uh, well, I, well, I think it's great to, to support uh, Little Leagues and, and, uh, and support our youth. Um, I'm not entirely in favor of this, and, and I'll tell you why. There's some, as we just heard, aging assets down at Riverside Park. Um, some of the diamonds are certainly a little worse for wear and whatnot. Um, you know, certainly we need to, we as a city are going to be the ones financially responsible for, for fixing those. Uh, some of the fencing, some of the dugouts. One dugout is almost in a V-shape at this point because of posts coming out of the ground. Um, six to $800, I feel it's a, it's a reasonable amount of money that they could find some private sponsorship for. And I think we as a city just, uh, I think we need to be careful um, when we get these kinds of asks. And, and I say that as somebody that now, you know, twice I've asked the, the Petawawa Civic Center for a break uh, for our Robbie Dean slow pitch tournament. That's a charitable organization. It's very, it's certainly local, it's very well known. Um, and twice the town of Petawawa has said, uh, has said no. Uh, so I, I certainly, um, Part of my reasoning for this is that is I think if they if if they went out and, and got some private sponsorship sponsorship I think they could find the six to eight hundred but I think we have to look at how we manage our assets in particular at Riverside Park because they are aging. Councillor Jacknell, then Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> when you say Upper Ottawa Valley Little League, uh, what does that encompass? Upper Ottawa Valley? Could you explain that to me? Or? Sure, so it's primarily um, kids from this area, from uh, Pembroke, um, Laurentian Valley. Uh, they shifted and changed their name. I can't quite recall. It used to be Pembroke Little League, and then they, they shifted, and I think, and I could be wrong on this, but I believe it was because at one point in time, ball was starting to, uh, to go downhill. Uh, it's kind of revived since then, so there was a, a name change, but it used to be, it's formerly known as uh, Pembroke Modern Ball. So how many people will we expect, uh, spectators and... Yeah, so Any I mean, th there, there'll be four full teams, and um, you know, I could only presume that there'll be families coming that um, you know will be staying in hotels, eating in restaurants, those type of things. So thank you. <clears throat> so I'm going to comment, then I'm going to make a motion. So, Councillor Fenier, you were chair of the Re Recreation Committee, Parks and Rec last term, and I was vice chair, and we worked with Dr. Williamson uh, quite extensively on trying to bring this tournament to Pembroke. But because of COVID, it got um, sidetracked. So they've been trying to bring it for a number of years. Now, Amanda, Dr. Amanda Williamson um, and her committee have grown, under their leadership, have grown baseball in Pembroke over the last number of years. They've taken, in, they've taken over the registration for Petawawa teams and outline teams also. And um, they've grown to over 400 members um, to play minor ball in Pembroke, and they're renting the facilities at Riverside Park. That's why we're trying to apply for that. That's why we apply for the drainage um, mitigation between Diamond uh, 1 and 2, I believe, where the water doesn't drain properly. Um, so, you know, this is a destination event. It's going to bring in people to our community. It's no different than uh, the Silver Stick. Um, that we give uh, free parking to on the weekends of that, and I know they pay a fee, but the Little League do pay full rental at the Riverside, and an event like this is premier for Pembroke, puts Pembroke on the map, and down the road to get future events, so it's only contributing to economic development, um, and it, it helps out the sports culture in Pembroke. So, you know, despite COVID, um, we're all coming out of COVID, this, this uh, subsidizing this is very important to show support for sports in Pembroke and the youth and the minor baseball association for all the work they've done. So I'm going to make a motion that we waive the waive the fee and support the tournament. I hope I get a seconder. Okay, it is moved by Deputy Mayor that we support the request. Seconded by Councillor Jack. No further comments. I'll call the question. All in favor? Three, four, it passes. Thank you. Next item. Private Area Business Association, Ruth, use of Riverside Park. Mike. 
sorry, I'll repeat that. <laughs> Next item, Pembroke and Area Fiddling Association, use of Riverside Park. Jordan, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so the recommendation for this report is that the Parks and Recreation Committee support the use of Riverside Park for the annual Pembroke Fiddle and Step Dancing Contest in the amount of $6,500. Uh, so most recently, the department had, res had been informed that the Pembroke Fiddle and Step Dancing Contest would resume in 2023. Um, the association plans to host the event from August 28th through to September 4th, so that's the same timeline as it has been in the past. And um, they have made some changes um, to their event itself. So they are looking to move the, the competitions itself for fiddling and step dancing. Uh, so they will not require the use of the PMC. Um, they will be uh, moving this to Festival Hall as a, an attempt to, uh, to save some operating costs as well as improve some of their, their sound quality um, for their contestants and their patrons. In the past, the association has rented two facilities for a total of $10,000. And additionally, there was an internal transfer of $4,000 from the, the city, uh, city's council approved budget uh, from economic development. So the last event that took place in 2019, um, the city did still incur costs, which uh, left us a balance of $5,896.11. Uh, this year, with the PMC not being required, uh, staff have investigated an appropriate cost to continue and host the Pembroke Fiddle and Park at Riverside Park um, only. And the department established a costing of uh, $6,500. So with the anticipated labor costs uh, to be significantly lower from not using the PMC, um, it is thought that uh, we could utilize the $4,000 that would be transferred from economic development that has been budgeted in this year's budget. And of course, we would um, anticipate that some labor costs um, could be absorbed in the regular operating budget. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. No comment, then I'll make a motion. Well, this is fantastic that this is coming back. And I want to commend the Don Rosine and the group, the new executive of the Fiddling Association. Um, people have been asking me about this. When's the fiddling coming? <laughs> When's the fiddling coming? And they're moving to Festival Hall. There's new seats. It sounds beautiful. So it's going to be all, uh, it'll be better for everyone. And it's lower cost for the staff because the PMC won't be used. It'll be focused at Riverside Park. And we'll see lots of trailers. And it's not like it wasn't its heyday, but it's still people coming to Pembroke and economic development and destination event and fiddling and step dancing, which we all like to do, and uh, it's going to be great. So I'll motion that we accept uh, the cost of 6500 for the rental of the uh, Riverside Park. Okay, we have a mover, Deputy Mayor, and second by Councillor Purcell. Correct. Further discussion? All in favor? Discussion. Councillor Keel? So, I mean, once again, we're being asked to contribute to an event that we're saying is, a, is an economic boom for the, the local city, um, you know, if the thing's bringing in money, I'm wondering why it can't pay for itself. Um, you know, this is, I mean, for, I mean, for the deputy to mayor say the Little League thing was a destination event, I mean, he's lowered the bar of destination events uh, to something that I've never heard of before. Point of information, um, um, this, they're, they're paying $6,500 rent for Riverside Park. It's not costing the city any money. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, Derushay? Oh, well, we do anticipate that there will be some incurred costs with labor. Right. So the, the $6,500 and then the $4,000 that would be transferred from the economic development budget, uh, we are anticipating that it will cost something. It will come out of the regular. Uh, as in previous years. Come out of the regular budget. Right, that's okay. correct. Okay, thank you. So if I can finish, my question is, where are we going with the extra costs? Like, do we have, do we have a, an estimate of what those additional costs are? Uh, um, are going to be in terms of the staffing and stuff or or do we feel that this is pretty close to covering costs so through the chair so this is um, essentially a new event in terms of we won't really understand those costs until we go through a, a complete cycle of it um, in 2019 when the last event was was held uh, the city did incur over fifty eight hundred dollars um, I don't ant anticipate that's going to be that expensive just because of the use of the PMC. Um, there's a lot of labor costs associated with opening up that, that facility. Um, so I do anticipate that there will be some incurred costs. I just I can't exactly estimate at this point in time how much that will be. So this to me sounds like a much better, uh, uh, like a, a much better ask in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the financial implications. Um, I do understand the fact that. Uh, uh, that it's a new event and, and so obviously there's going to be a little bit of change there but it's it sounds to me like this one uh, 
we have a little better handle on it. But I, I appreciate that being maybe not new, but certainly significantly modified from a prior event that uh, I suppose it might take us a run to, uh, to figure out exact things. But your suggestion that prior one's 5,800, I mean, that's, uh, that, uh, that sounds to me like it's uh, within reason. Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Chair. Question to Mr. Jaroche. The What is the amount that the uh, Fiddle Fest is paying? Like, Do they actually pay to rent the, the, the park, or is it this is just a total, um, I guess, cost covered by the city? So through the chair. So we don't actually have a, a, um, a user fee established for the park for something of this ask. So typically what we do is we're looking at, okay, what are we anticipating our labor costs are going to be? Um, you know, there's going to be different fees that we'll have to pay for electrical and whatnot. So we try and build on that and try and come up with a cost. Um, I should note that um, in previous years, whenever uh, Fiddle was paying $10,000, uh, I believe originally uh, when it came to uh, council, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $15,000. Um, but when I went back to the association, they said we just simply can't afford that. Um, so I don't know what their revenue is like. So that at that point in time, it was established as $10,000. And that's how we got to uh, absorbing some of the costs. So supplementary, are they, pay are they paying anything this time? Yeah, so through the chair, so they'll be paying us $6,500. So they're, okay. Good. Thank you. Councillor Jackno, and then the Mayor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, not everybody drives an RV and stays at Riverside Park. The hotels and motels are full. People will come as they age. Uh, they're not, you know, capable of backing up an RV as well as they used to do when they were 60. But now when they're 75 or approaching 80, they're still driving their vehicle and they want to come and observe. So if you check the statistics out, you'll find that most, you won't be able to get a hotel room here during that time frame. Thank you. Just to thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. One of the uh, uh, items as well is that uh, in terms of, as, as we've said many times before, is that um, the city, if we can not uh, manufacture events it's it's better to have someone else manufacture the event uh, and if there it means some sort of contribution from the city uh, but let the lion's share of the work or all of the work go to an association or an organization uh, then at least it's not occupying uh, and requiring the city to manufacture that particular event thank you if I could just speak from the chair just a brief comment um, coming out of COVID I'm just happy to see a lot of these things taking place. And if it's not costing us a lot, as the mayor said, we're not hosting it. So if other individuals want to have events, um, I think it's great. And not to mention, it's not just the tourists visiting this community. A lot of the local residents really enjoy going down to the Riverside Park during the contest. So I think they're going to embrace it. And like I said, um, if we have to nurture them a little, once we get back to normal, more, whatever normal is, I think that maybe then we can start looking at charging a little more. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll, I'll, I'll call for a motion. The motion, Councillor Jagano seconded Okay, it. so we have a mover, a seconder. I'll call the question. All in favor? Approved. Thank you. And next, uh, permanent pickleboard courts at Kins Kinsman Park. <laughs> Thank you. So the recommendation for this report is that the Parks and Recreation Committee recommends, number one, that a permanent pickleball court is established at the Kinsman Park Multipurpose Court. Number two, that council directs staff to develop an agreement that satisfies both the programming needs of the Pembroke Pickleball Club and the Parks and Recreation Department. And number three, that council directs staff to bring forth a report for the Pembroke Pickleball Club to enter into an agreement with the City of Pembroke for a permanent pickleball court at Kinsman Park. Uh, currently, the, the court has been primarily used as a multipurpose court. And over the past couple of years, it certainly served the purpose for the uh, Pembroke Pickleball Club, and they've util utilized the space by erecting temporary temporary nets. And uh, this is something that's that's worked really well. Um, you know, we were in the middle of COVID, so setting up, taking down, um, and also too, I think that they've they've seen their their membership grow as well. It's a popular sport; it's getting popular by the day. Um, so it's something that they're looking to now put in something more permanent. Um, so up to three single courts can allow for a variety of sports to be played on the surface at one time. And currently the way it's configured right now is that there's uh, permanent uh, basketball courts on the north side of the court. Um, we have uh, temporary 
um, hockey nets erected for the, the summer months in the middle court, and then we'd be looking at putting the, the permanent pickleball courts on the, the south side. Um, as far as cost goes, uh, the Pembroke Pickleball Club anticipates that it'd be no less than $5,000. And uh, they're looking to perform the work, purchase and install the equipment. Uh, so again, there, there would be no financial cost to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? I have a comment before I make a motion. Um, so this uh, particular project is very dear to my heart. 19 years ago, uh, the Kinsman Club, I chaired this project, Kinsman Multi Sports Court, in consultation with uh, the, um, the then staff at the Parks and Rec office. And um, it was decided in a multi-sports court, so basketball and ball hockey. Um, Kinsman Club put in 25000 and we were able to get a grant, a trillion grant that my, my wife wrote, actually wrote the application to help us out, um, of $17,000. And here we have a Kinsman multi-sports court today. So um, Dr. Hobart and I and Councillor Frenier corresponded regularly last term about the development of pickleball. And I met with him. Um, a number of months ago, you know, I think it was the fall or August maybe last year. And I had some, to be honest, I had some concerns at the beginning, but after he explained it to me, what they were thinking of doing, and I know how popular pickleball is, and I've, I've been meaning to try it myself. And uh, I want to commend staff, and Jordan, you and I talked extensively about it, and um, I've seen the court many times the last few weeks as I walk the, the students to go swimming every Friday at 2 o'clock. And uh, so you reconfigured the court. You have the pickleball, then you have the ball hockey, then you have the basketball. And if, so, and if you know if somebody wanted to have a ball hockey tournament, they could bring in two nets and put them in front of the basketball. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. So I congratulate the pickleball court and want to thank staff for this. And the condition of the Trillium Grant was that, it, was that it always be used as a multi-sports court. So. You could have people playing basketball, ball hockey, and pickleball at the same time. And most of the time, that doesn't happen. But there are youth and adults that use it. Um, two weeks ago, when we went by, there were uh, older gentlemen, you know, um, they were rollerblading and playing ball hockey. So it gets used quite a bit. So I'd like to motion that we accept the recommendations. Moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Keel. Any further comments, questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Approved. And finally, Church Street party road closure. Again. All right, thank you. So I should note that the, uh, the applicant uh, has withdrawn the request for this, so we will not be uh, needing to move forward with this report. Thank you. Okay, so seeing nothing else on the agenda, can I have a mo motion to adjourn? Councillor Keel, Deputy Mayor, all in favor? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this council meeting to order for May 16th, 2023. Uh, at this time, I would ask that everyone please stand for an opening prayer or reflection. Before opening this meeting of council, I would ask those who wish, each in your own way, silently join in a prayer of guidance over these proceedings. Thank you. Are there any disclosure of pecuniary interest uh, this evening? Okay. Um, in respect to myself, I'll be uh, disclosing, and I am disclosing, uh, in respect to bylaw 2023 16, because I'm the individual mentioned in it, 2023 36 and uh, 2023 42, to be consistent with. Uh, um, those two particular matters as they've worked their way through the committees. Uh, so in respect to those three, I will be calling upon the, uh, uh, the deputy mayor at that time. Um, in respect to minutes, we have first up regular meeting of council May 2nd, 2023. Um, I have moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Giacono. Those in favor? Okay, those are approved. And next we have adoption of minutes from committees. The first one is Parks and Recreation. It was April 18th, 2023, circulated in the package. I'd entertain a motion for that. Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Keel. Those in favor, and that is carried. The next adoption is the Operations Committee from the same date, April 18th, 2023. Moved by Councillor Purcell, seconded by Councillor uh, Plummer. Those in favor, that's carried. Last but not least, receiving minutes from local boards, as we often do, Pembroke Heritage Murals Committee, May 3rd, 2023. Councilor Purcell, second by Councilor Plummer. Those in favor? Thank you, that is carried. For committee reports, the first we have, and only committee report we have this evening, uh, call upon Councilor Plummer in respect to phase four reconstruction. Thank you, Worship. I self second by Deputy, Deputy Mayor. A tender number 20-0264-4 for the reconstruction of West Phase 4 be awarded to h and Construction, Inc. for the estimated contract value of $1,599,014.59 plus HST. And that additional expenditures in the amount of $80,000 be approved in a contingency allowance for a total value of recommendation equal to $1,679,014.59. Um, operations of committee of council begs and reports to recommend from meeting held this evening. Moved by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Abdallah, sorry, Deputy Mayor Abdallah, tender number 20-0264-4, reconstruction of Pembroke Street West, phase four, be awarded to h, h Construction for the estimated value of $1,599,014.59 plus HST, with additional expenditures in the amount of 80,000 for contingency allowance total value being $1,679,014.59. Councilor Plummer, did you wish to speak to this one? Uh, just This is uh, the final phase of the grant program that's uh, updated the Pembroke Street uh, from that'll be finishing from Christie Street all the way to the city limits. So it's been a phase uh, four phase project for the last four years and then like, we're very happy to see the completion and have a nice smooth ride from one end of the city to the other now. Thank you. Uh, call the question. Those in favor? And that is carried. Great. For proclamations this evening, by virtue of the power vested in me, I do hereby declare the week of June 1st through the 4th as Pride Week in the city of Pembroke. Whereas the city of Pembroke values diversity and strives to be a safe and welcoming community for all. And whereas people who are two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender diverse contribute greatly to all facets of our community, but can also continue to fight for acceptance and equality in our society. And whereas Pride Week is an opportunity to celebrate the progress made by, to recognize and protect the rights of the LGBTQS plus communities and to reflect on the work that still needs to be done. And whereas June is recognized as Pride Month and June 2nd and 3rd mark the Pride Walk and the Pride Festival in the city of Pembroke. 
whereas the Pride Walk and the Pride Festival serve as an opportunity for members of the LGBTQS plus community, their loved ones and allies to come together to celebrate who they are and who they love while promoting the ongoing cause of acceptance, equality and freedom for all. And whereas the City of Pembroke stands against discrimination in all forms and promotes human rights and dignity of all persons. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Ron of a Mayor of the City of Pembroke, do hereby proclaim June 1st through the 4th Pride Week in the City of Pembroke and encourage everyone in our city and surrounding areas to take advantage of this opportunity to build bridges of understanding, respect, and celebration. Pride Month uh, takes place from June 1st through to the 30th, and I make this proclamation to recognize the importance of diversity in our community. The City of Pembroke values and appreciates the contributions of all ethnicities, cultures, contributions, uh, and in the month of June, we highlight the contributions of the LGBTQ2S plus community making uh, to our city. This year, uh, there will be a variety of events uh, over the course of June 2nd, 3rd and 4th, including a Pride Walk, as I've said earlier, starting at the Pembroke Amphitheatre and on June 2nd at 6.30. And there's also a festival on June 3rd, starting at 11 o'clock at the Coronation Park. I want to encourage everyone to join myself as we create an inclusive, safe and welcoming community for everyone. Next, we have bylaws. Your, your Worship, if I may? Yes. Um, simply Sorry. because we can't, uh, we don't have a, a point to amend the uh, agenda. Correct. I wonder if, with unanimous consent, if it would make more sense to proceed with 7A, 7B, and then 7H immediately <laughs> while, you're, uh, while you're absent. I, I would totally appreciate that. <laughs> Less exercise <Yeah>. for me. <laughs> hey, thank you. Okay, so we'll deal with uh, A, B, and H. Uh, let the minutes show that the mayor has uh, left, the, left the desk, left the room. Okay, uh, bylaw 2023-16, two, sale of land along Willard Street to Ron Gervais, Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and uh, members of council. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Plummer that bylaw 2023-16 being a bylaw to authorize the proposed sale of lands be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Deputy Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation and awaiting your signature, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Ed Jackano, seconded by Councillor Andrew Plummer, that bylaw 2023 16, a bylaw to authorize the proposed sale of lands, be adopted and passed, and further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Deputy Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Would you like to speak to the motion, uh, Councillor Jackano? I would. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and members of Council. <clears throat> uh, at the March 7, 2023 Planning and Development Committee meeting, uh, this item was tabled until an application was uh, proceeded with, with an appraisal of the land, uh, which has uh, since been done. The property uh, approximately is 1,025 square feet, and the uh, site has a substantial drop off to the water's edge of the Indian River. Uh, therefore, it is the opinion of the appraiser that the subject property could not be developed and that the highest and best use of the subject is judged to be as an add-on property to the neighboring property. Uh, the original offer to uh, purchase that piece of property was brought forward by Mr. Ron Gervais at $1,000. Uh, the property's been appraised at $750, so it seems we have a $250 deficit. As well, uh, a survey had to be completed, which is standard procedure <coughs> under, under the uh, Municipal Act and the Planning Act. So there was a cost of a survey there with uh, a price as well and also cost of land appraisal, which was fairly significant. So uh, this has been approved and it's ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jagano. Any other councillor would like to make a comment? No, okay, call the question. Those in favor of the motion, carried unanimously. Uh, bylaw 
2023-36, Sale and Disposition of Land Policy. Councillor Jackano. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, moved by myself and second again by Councillor Andrew Plummer that bylaw 2023-36 a bylaw to adopt a sale and disposition of land policy for the Corporation of the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed. And further that the said bylaw be signed uh, by the mayor, or I guess it should be the deputy mayor. Uh, excuse me, the deputy mayor will be making an amendment there, and the clerk and seal with the seal of the corporation and awaiting your signature, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackano. Okay. Moved by Councillor Ed Jackano, seconded by Councillor Andrew Plummer, the bylaw 2023-36, a bylaw to adopt a sale and disposition of land policy for the corporation of the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Deputy Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Uh, Comments, Councillor Jackano? I will, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, there are some changes were made to the bylaw based on the direction at our last meeting. So therefore, number one, all roads, uh, road allowances, whether open or closed, will be part of public registry of surplus lands. Secondly, registry of surplus lands will be brought before a committee or at a later date, once various subcommittees have a chance to review it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, point of information, I was speaking to Ms. Seabarth today, and she is currently, been, she's been working on an inventory of lands, and she's still working on it, and she will be bringing that to uh, Ms. Sorio on a future date. They're juggling different projects at the same time. Uh, any further comments on that motion? No, call the question. Those in favor? Motion carried. We'll jump down to item H uh, with the approval of consensus of the council. Thank you. Um, bylaw 2023-42, procurement bylaw. Councillor Plummer. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Move by myself, served by Councillor Keel. That bylaw 2023-42, a bylaw for the City of Pembroke to governing procedure, uh, procurement policies and procedures be adopted and passed. And further said uh, bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and seal the seal of the corporation. Sure, I got the wrong bylaw. Okay. <laughs> I'll bring it myself. It's like a game. Oh, oh, well, there you go. Thank you. Oh. Um, so, oh, okay. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, moved by Councillor Andrew Plummer, seconded by Councillor Ian Keel, that bylaw 2023 42, a bylaw for the City of Pembroke, governing procurement policies and procedures be adopted and passed, and further, that the said bylaw be signed by the uh, Deputy Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Uh, comments, Councillor Plummer? Yes, I'll, uh, as this was discussed uh, at length, I, uh, substantially back a uh, previous meeting, I'll just do some highlights just to remind okay. people. Uh, so at the April 18th regular council meeting, the council and CEO were instructed to prepare an amendment to the procurement bylaw limiting professional services contracts to no more than five years. As a result, the following changes and comments are presented in discussion below. Uh, so uh, the consulting services and professions recurring. So a term of a contract for consulting services or professional services may not exceed a period of five years without formal approval by council. Uh, that was the main uh, gist of the uh, procurement. I'm not going to go through the multi pages of uh, reading the entire procurement policy, but that was the understanding. And I believe council came to a successful decision and moving forward and not uh, basically signing contracts for perpetuity. So now we have a limiting contract. So moving forward, I think this council is more united and we understand we all want to work towards the same goal. And now that all services will be rendered to five years unless council specifically votes to move forward with longer term. Thank you. Any further comments? No? Okay. Uh, call the question. Those in favor? Carried. Um, can you uh, ask the mayor to re enter the chambers? Oh, he's right there. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh, I thought you left the room. Okay, sorry. Good. Thank you. That's why I was wondering why you were saying that. I don't know. Okay. No, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Um, 
Okay, 7C bylaw 2023-37 revision of property standards bylaw, Councilor Keel. Purcell, okay, Councilor Purcell. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Jackno that bylaw 2023-37, a bylaw to amend the bylaw 2021-25 is amended, being a bylaw for prescribing standards for the maintenance and occupancy of property within the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed and further the City bylaw be signed by the Mayor and the Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Moved by Councillor Purcell, seconded by Councillor Jackano, bylaw 2023-37, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2021-25 as amended, being a bylaw for prescribing standards for maintenance and occupancy of property within the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and seal with the seal of the Corporation. Did you wish to speak to it? Certainly. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just that uh, we've altered the uh, property standards bylaw uh, to a seven day compliance period with an order for garbage that attracts vermin. However, we're still keeping the 14 day appeal period. So this just allows earlier compliance date, allows the city to obtain estimates uh, for compliance date um, and the appeal period to ensure removal takes place as soon as possible after the appeal period. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Keel. Um, well, I, while I understand the purpose uh, of this change, uh, of course, when you put out garbage, uh, you probably don't want it to be sitting there for 14 days. Um, however, I'm going to remind Council, as I did when this item first came up, uh, that under the Building Code Act, uh, a notice goes out and then you have 14 days to appeal. I, while I appreciate Council wanting to act quicker than 14 days, um, I think we're acting outside um, of our jurisdiction when we try and lay a charge before the, uh, before the resident uh, has the opportunity to appeal. I know that the assurances were given by staff that that's not how they're going to proceed, um, except that that's exactly what the purpose of this bylaw is. So um, I will be voting against this because I, I think it's setting up uh, an illegal fine structure um, and I'll be asking for a recorded vote. Uh, Mr. Unruh? Are you, you're calling the vote? No, oh, sorry. Mr. Ron, Ron, if you can um, do it as it's asked, uh, the request has been made for a recorded vote. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Deputy Mayor Brian Abdalla? Uh, yay. Councillor Ed Jackano? Yes. Councillor Ian Keel? Nay. Councillor Pat Lafrenier? Yay. Councillor Andrew Plummer? Yay. Councillor Troy Purcell? Yay. And Mayor Ron Gervais? Yay. So the yeas have it, six to one. Motion passes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anra. Um, Next is 2023-38, an amendment uh, build, uh, to building bylaw. Do you have this one, Councillor Purcell? I do. do. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Keel that bylaw 2023-38, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2018-01, as amended being a bylaw to provide for the administration enforcement of the Building Code Act in the city of Pembroke be adopted and passed and further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of this corporation. Thank you, Mr. Honor. By Councillor Purcell, seconded by Councillor Keel, bylaw 2023-38, a bylaw to amend 2018-01, as amended being a bylaw to provide for the administration and enforcement of the Building Code Act in the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Purcell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, changes to the building bylaw include uh, insurances in terms of uh, draining, sorry, drainage and service plans. Um, for property are submitted and approved prior to the issuance of the building permit. And as well, um, RAM boxes are required for residential buildings with more than three stories that are not subject to a site plan agreement as well. Thank you.
Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to this one? Seeing none, call the question. Those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Next one is 2023-39 PBIA Church. That's being canceled. No. Uh, Church Street on a Street Patio. This is the encroachment agreement as opposed to Yeah, this to is the, the pa patio encroachment agreement. Yeah. Councilor Frenier. Ignore the story. <laughs> we'll Okay, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Troy Purcell, that bylaw 2023-39, a bylaw to authorize the entering into an encroachment agreement between the Pembroke Business Improvement Area, PBIA, and the Corporation of the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed. And further, that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Moved by Councillor Lafreniere, seconded by Councillor Purcell, that uh, bylaw 2023-39, a bylaw to authorize the entering into an encroachment agreement between the Pembroke Business Improvement Area and the Corporation of the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Lafreniere? Yes, at the May 3rd Planning and Development Committee meeting, uh, committee agreed to allow an outdoor on-street patio, and this patio was located somewhere else last year. We've decided now to locate it uh, from Church Street to uh, just in front of Nomada Tacos, and I believe it's going to be a great location uh, for patrons of that business or, or other individuals that would like to sit there and have lunch or have coffee or so I really uh, compliment the PBIA in, in continuing to enhance the outdoor atmosphere in downtown during the summer, and I commend committee members for supporting them. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to that one? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Against? Carried. Next one is 2023-40 Emergency Management Program and Emergency Plan Bylaw, Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship of Myself, Second by Councillor Jack, I know that Bylaw 2023-40, a bylaw to authorize and adopt the City of Pembroke's Emergency Management Program and Emergency Plan be adopted and passed, and further the said bylaw be signed by Mayor and Clerk and seal the seal of the Corporation. Moved by Councillor Plummer, seconded by Councillor Jackano, that bylaw 2023 40, a bylaw to authorize and adopt the City of Pembroke's Emergency Management Program and Emergency Plan be adopted and passed, and further that said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and seal with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Plummer. Thank you. This is the, an update to bylaw 2022 21, the Emergency Management Program and Emergency Plan, uh, emergency plan to reflect addition of personnel, the Chief uh, the CAO, the Treasurer, and IT staff to the Emergency Management Program Committee. Okay, call the question, those in favor of that one, and that's carried, great. Next is 2023-41, Pembroke 50 Plus Active Living Center Lease Agreement. Councillor Keel. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Purcell, the bylaw 2023-41, a bylaw to authorize the entering into of an agreement with the Pembroke 50 Plus Active Living Center, uh, relevant to the rental of city-owned property located at 42 Renton Street, uh, be adopted and passed, and further that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Councillor Keel, seconded by Councillor Purcell, that bylaw 2023 41, a bylaw to authorize the entering into an agreement with the Pembroke 50 plus Active Living Center rel relevant to the rental city owned property located at 42 Renfrew Street be adopted and passed, and further the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Keel. Uh, this is a, a great achievement, certainly, uh, to be able to continue on uh, our lease with the uh, Pembroke 50 Plus Active Living Center. Uh, this is an immensely important organization to the City of Pembroke. Um, it, it probably should be even more beneficial. Uh, I certainly wish a lot more of our residents uh, would make use of it. 
I certainly encourage anyone uh, who has uh, friends or family members um, that have not checked out the 50 plus active living center to, to go and look at uh, the many, many, many programs um, that it offers. Um, it's, a, it's a great social atmosphere for our seniors. Um, it uh, provides physical activity for our seniors. Um, there's really not a negative thing that I could say about this particular group and I am so pleased uh, that the city will be carrying on its uh, lease with them uh, for the next five years. Thank you. Call the question. Those in favor, that is carried. Uh, the last one under bylaw is a 2023-43 ATV bylaw amendment. Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship. By myself, Senator Councillor Jackano, at bylaw 2023-43, a bylaw to amend the bylaw 2017-69 to regulate the govern the operation of all-terrain, multi-purpose, and recreational off-road vehicles within the city of Pembroke be adopted and passed. And further said bylaw be signed by the mayor and clerk and seal the seal of the corporation. Moved by Councillor Plummer, second by Councillor Jackson of the bylaw 2023-43, a bylaw to amend bylaw 2017-69 to regulate and govern the operation of all-terrain, multi-purpose and recreational off-road vehicles collectively called off-road vehicles within the City of Pembroke be adopted and passed and further the said bylaw be signed by the Mayor and Clerk and sealed with the seal of the Corporation. Councillor Plummer. Thank you, Worship. Uh, quick, uh, I guess, recap. So the changes under Schedule A for bylaw 2017-69 to regulate and govern the operation of all-terrain multi-purpose vehicles uh, within the City of Pembroke is revised and permitted as prescribed for a new prescribed route for a one-year period and that the Renfrew County ATV Club be urged to continue working with an alternate route uh, and a letter be sent to residents along the area. So the new southern route, uh, so as you know, the CN, portion of the CN rail line have been sold, so the ATV Club can no longer use uh, the portion to access the, uh, let's say, get to the big uh, Irving Big Stop and hotels. So now the portion of the route uh, from the southern portion of the municipality, it goes from McKay Street from city limits to Town Line Road, Town Line Road to McKay Street to River Road, uh, through the, under the Bennett Street Crossing at, Forrester Fraser, uh, at the Foster Fraser Bridge to Everett Street, Bennett Street uh, from Everett Street to Boundary Road, and then you take an International Drive from Boundary Road to Upper Valley Drive, and then on Upper Valley Drive from International to International Drive, then International Drive to Upper Valley Drive and ending at Paul Martin, therefore crossing to Paul Martin to access the Irving Big Stop. Thank you. Thank you. Call the question. Those in favor? Uh, carried. Next this evening, we have motions. We have one. Council Lafreniere, Resolution 2023-010. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Troy Purcell. Whereas Bill 5, the Stopping Harassment and Abuse by Local Leaders Act, 2022 was introduced in the Ontario Legislature by MPP Stephen Blay during a private member's bill on August 10, 2022, and whereas over 20 municipalities have formally endorsed and communicated public support for Bill 5, and whereas the City of Pembroke and Council are committed to demonstrating good governance and greater accountability to its code of conduct and workplace policies. Therefore, be it resolved, that Council of the City of Pembroke endorses Bill 5, the Stopping Harassment and Abuse by Local Leaders Act 2022, which would require the Code of Conduct for Municipal Councillors and members of local boards to include a requirement to comply with workplace violence and harassment policies, and permit municipalities to direct the Integrity Commissioner to apply to the court to vacate a member's seat if the Commissioner's inquiry determines that the member has contravened this requirement, and that the City forward a copy of this resolution to the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Steve Clark, Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and MPP John Yakabuski, Member of Provincial Parliament, Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. There you go. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. 
So moved by Councillor Frenier and seconded by Councillor Purcell, whereas Bill 5, the Stopping Harassment and Abuse by Local Leaders Act 2022, was introduced in the Ontario Legislature by MPP Stephen Blay through a private member's bill August 10, 2022, whereas over 20 municipalities have formally endorsed and communicated public support for Bill 5, whereas the City of Pembroke and Council are committed to demonstrating good governance and greater accountability to its code of conduct and workplace policies. Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Pembroke endorse Bill 5, the Stopping Harassment and Abuse by Local Leaders Act 2022, which would require the code of conduct for municipal councillors and members of local boards to include a requirement to comply with workplace violence and harassment policies and permit municipalities to direct the integrity commissioner to apply to the court to vacate a member's seat if the commissioner's inquiry determined that the member has contravened this requirement and that the City of Pembroke forward a copy of the resolution, this resolution, to the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Steve Clark, Ontario Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and MPP John Yakabuski, our Member of Provincial Parliament. Councillor Lafreniere? Um, yes, uh, this crossed my desk, and I thought it very interesting, um, the climate in politics, you know, in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, and every level, has really changed. Um, I've been around this table a while, as Councillor Chacno has, and, and I think it's just time for us to, to say to the public that we respect them and our staff and ourselves, each other, and that we can work together and respect our differences of opinions. And we can be nice to staff. I mean, they have to follow all these policies, but for some reason, we're held at a higher regard. Well, I don't think we need to be. I think that we need to respect the same code of conduct and harassment policies that our staff and management have to follow. And that's exactly what this is, so that we cannot abuse our positions of power. And we can't let it go to our head and, and just say what we want, regardless of who we're, we're hurting or damaging. So I hope you'll support this, because I think it's a step forward to try to change the atmosphere you know, around local, uh, local federal, provincial. I hope it goes right through the whole gamut. So thank you very much. Councillor Keel, you wish to speak to it? And if I, if I can add some history to Councillor Lafreniere's comments, um, this bill is coming out of a horrible situation. Um, essentially, in terms of the background, uh, what happened was there was a member of the Ottawa Council um, accused of three separate instances of, of, uh, of sexual harassment. Um, and of course, uh, he was, uh, they did take disciplinary action and when they got to the end, it was of course realized that the worst thing that they could do to a member that has sexually harassed three staff members of his uh, municipality is they could reprimand, essentially a, a, a warning, and they, could, uh, and they could suspend pay for, I believe it's 90 days. Now, when you're talking sexual harassment, when you're talking, um, frankly, all other forms of harassment and, and ongoing nature, um, that's, that's not enough. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's great for this member of provincial parliament um, who was at the time on Ottawa City Council to raise this issue. I certainly hope that it will have bipartisan support in the Ontario Legislature. Um, it does provide safeguards um, for anybody worried that it could be abused. The Integrity Commissioner uh, first needs to look at it and then a judge needs to decide that there's a basis to remove a councillor. I don't know what more um, checks and balances you could have for something like that. Um, I couldn't thank Councillor Lafreniere more for, for bringing this up. Um, certainly private members' bills, as I'm sure she knows, sometimes take a little help to get through. Um, private member bills rarely get through the legislature, um, but I certainly hope that this, uh, frankly, this is one that should pass the legislature with unanimous uh, support, and I hope it'll pass our council tonight with unanimous support. Thank you, Councillor Keel. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak to it? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Unrod, perhaps if, if I can ask for a recorded vote, as I'm, I'm hoping that will give, as Councillor Keel says, some extra emphasis <laughs> to, uh, to the uh, legislature. Okay, uh, so Deputy Mayor Brian Abdalla? Yay. Councillor Ed Jackano? Yes. 
Councillor Ian Keel. Yay. Councillor Pat Lafrenier. Yes. Councillor Ad Andrew Plummer. Yay. Councillor Troy Purcell. Yay. And Mayor Ron Gervais. Yay. So unanimously carried, uh, seven to zero. Thank you. And your worship, if I could speak out of turn, I would remind sure. this council that the last time we encouraged the Ontario government to do something, <laughs> we had action uh, on VTAC within a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. So I certainly wish for Councillor Lafreniere's uh, <laughs> motion to have the exact same speedy uh, end. Well put, uh, Councillor Kale. Uh, next up is Mayor's Report. Um, on May 4th, I had the pleasure to attend the official opening of the Water and Dirt Festival. It will be held from August 12th through August 27th, with events being held in partnering municipalities, namely the Town of Petawawa, Town of Deep River, Township of North Algona Wilberforce, Township of Laurentian Valley, and of course the City of Pembroke, so it has grown since uh, last year with additional municipalities. This is a great example of municipalities pulling together to accomplish larger events uh, and everyone enjoying the rewards of that. I'd ask that everyone go to wateranddirt.ca for more details. At this uh, um, particular kickoff, uh, CNL president was present and provided a check uh, to provide some additional funding for that, uh, that uh, collective event. <coughs> On uh, May 6th, I had the pleasure of attending the Veterans Appreciation Dinner at Legion Branch 72 uh, and to seeing Councillor Kale's grandfather again. <laughs> uh, very grateful that I'm always welcome there and uh, receive such a, a huge welcome as Dan Halliday always says that <laughs> I'm always welcome to be there. I had the pleasure to bring greetings uh, to those in attendance. Um, it is always great to uh, receive, on the other hand, uh, this such a, a warm welcome that you feel like you're at home. Uh, truly appreciate the talk from the guest speaker who spoke about her accomplishments and challenges in the military and the achievements that uh, women have made in the military. In all, I had always appreciated the opportunity to attend the Legion, uh, any Legion event, uh, where I'm always welcome with warm smiles, a great meal, uh, and excellent conversation. On May 12th, I had the pleasure to receive the flag for Fallon Daffa Day, which is celebrated on May 13th. The city proudly flew the flag from the 12th through the 15th as it was spanning over the weekend. Uh, it, was, it was great to meet the organizers and to have a conversation with them. <coughs> On May 14th, I had the pleasure to be part of the Pembroke Community Expo as a representative of the Pembroke Police Services Board. I was pleased that a number of members of our council attended the event in some way, shape or form, whether attending a booth or whether just simply being uh, present to welcome the various organizations and businesses there. I was very pleased to see a number of the people that turned out despite the fact that we had terrific weather and I was quite surprised at the number of people that showed up for the event. Uh, well done and congratulations to the organizers uh, of the event um, that entered uh, their booths as well. Uh, certainly it's grown since last year and it's uh, expected, I believe, that it will just continue to grow. Uh, in, in respect to the Ottawa River, I'm sure that we've all noticed that it's receded. I see that the Township of Whitewater has rescinded their, uh, their emergency uh, declaration. Um, staff will continue to monitor the situation closely. I know Mr. Lewis is still here with us and uh, I know that they take it all very seriously. And as always, stay safe and be kind to one another. Uh, next is notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion this evening? Seeing none, are there councillor updates? Councillor Lafreniere. The third annual Jim Sloan Memorial Ball Hockey Tournament is taking place May 27th, and there's still room for some teams if they want to sign up. And I want to thank Count uh, Deputy Mayor for reminding me to advise you about this. I won't take all the credit. <laughs> um, there are two divisions. If anyone out there is interested in signing up, uh, 13 and under, four, and 14 and up. And all proceeds go to the Pembroke and Area Boys and Girls Club. And I know Jim Sloan, uh, I knew him personally, and I actually sat on the board of the Pembroke Boys and Girls Club with him for many years. And I know he had a passion to help the youth. And even as a police officer for the Pembroke Police many years ago, he was also in tune, always in tune with the youth, and he'd often stop and talk to them. And I remember 
them thinking he was one of the good guys, you know. He wasn't able to just get them, you know. So I just say that, you know, Jim would be smiling down at this tournament and, and at all the good work that the Boys and Girls Club are doing. Secondly, Waterfront Live, June 16th, it's going to kick off with uh, every night entertainment at 7 p.m., uh, except for movie nights, of course. And if anyone wants to register uh, to entertain at Waterfront Live, they can contact the Recreation Department and uh, take it from there. Thank you very much. Councillor Frenier, Councillor Jackano, and then Councillor Keel. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, and in comment uh, to Councillor Frenier's uh, uh, little talk about the, uh, the Memorial Center and what took place. Uh, the bicycle rodeo, I think, is so important where young children learn the rules of the road. Uh, many times, hey, there's drivers that should learn the rules of the road if you look around. But it all starts in the beginning with uh, respect for the roadway, understanding, you know, what a turn signal means, etc. And if that's infused in youth today, there'll be better drivers of tomorrow with their vehicles. It was wonderful. Thank you. Councillor Keel. Just a quick update, coming up at Festival Hall is the Stars of Motion Annual Showcase on May 26th. And then uh, I think this will come prior to our next council meeting, uh, the uh, Ateo uh, Dance uh, Studio. Yes, Adio. Adio Dance Studio presents Road Trip uh, Saturday, June 3rd. So once again, uh, I hope everyone continues to support uh, our largest uh, theater between Ottawa and uh, and North Bay and uh, continues to support, uh, I know Stars in Motion is certainly one of our uh, local groups and, uh, and uh, yeah, get out, bring the family. Thank you. Councillor Purcell. Uh, <clears throat> I guess just a quick comment about the Community Expo and um, the turnout that we had. I, was, I had the pleasure of uh, manning the Pembroke booth uh, on Friday evening from 4 to 8 p.m. and uh, had some really good interesting discussions with uh, uh, residents of the city of Pembroke and a lot of visitors that were really interested in the uh, recreation um, guide that we have uh, published for 2023 which uh, I got a lot of feedback on saying that that was a excellent resource so so uh, kudos to uh, all those involved in terms of putting that recreation guide together um, the other point that I have is in regards to the governance committee for the Renfrew County District Health Unit. Um, there are um, some um, provincially appointed uh, members. Um, we're looking for some succession planning, um, so we're anticipating some vacancies within the next six months. Um, so in terms of the Renfrew County District Health Board, um, if you're interested, please um, kind of look at the media advertising that's available. Um, and uh, please respond, and those applicants will be reviewed by the governance committee, and those names will be brought forward accordingly. Thank you. Okay, any councillor, uh, sorry, deputy mayor. Okay. I have a few items tonight. Um, the Pembroke Care for Community Garden begins its fourth year this year at the corner of Deacon Street and River Road, uh, where we have a meeting open to the public at 11 a.m. for membership and volunteer. I want to thank all the volunteers who have come forward, and we're always looking for more volunteers. Uh, you can contact Mayor G Gervais or myself. I want to thank the mayor. Um, the mayor has a bit of a habit. Uh, I'll, he'll say, what needs to be done in the garden? And I'll say, well, we got a road to tell. you got to throw in the sheep manure. So lo and behold, I go to the garden last week to, to get the rain barrel for the rain barrel booth we had at the community garden booth at the expo. And the mayor's already wrote a tale and put the manure in. He said, oh, I had some energy Friday night. So I went over and did it. So this is a week ago. So kudos to you, uh, Mayor Gervais. So yes, uh, we begin our fourth year and uh, we're very thankful to care for and the city of Pembroke and the partnership we have and also the partnership with the St. Joseph's Food Bank. We'll be planting uh, Pierrette Filio, who was on the Seniors Advisory Committee and is one of my neighbors, she said, don't don't plant till after the long week. The uh, don't plant till after the full moon in uh, June, the first moon in June, because the mayor and I planted two years ago tomato plants, and they all got frozen the long weekend in May. We planted, so we're not going to plant till after the first full moon in June. So her grandmother told her that. Um, on behalf of the Affordable Housing Alliance of the Ottawa Valley, I, I sit on the steering committee, and I co-chair the local committee with. Uh, Cameron Montgomery and Council of is on the committee. We want to thank the City of Pembroke for sponsoring the uh, letter to the CMHC Innovation Fund. 
The application has been submitted, and I was communicating with Cameron yesterday, and there's getting edits with the contacts she has at CMHC. So we hope that goes through. Uh, we want to thank the city for supporting and council the Sparrow Home Share. And today, lo and behold, on the staff media channels, I saw the Share of Home Share advertised. So thank you very much. Um, plus, uh, requesting staff to return with a report on the possibility of a special tax class for affordable housing. We want to thank council and the city for considering that. Uh, May 4th, we had the first uh, youth council meeting at the library. We had a very, very positive turnout and discussion on community, what Pembroke needs. It's going to take a while to build the group, but we had uh, representation from Algonquin College, Amy Bramberger, and uh, Megan Babcock from the, the uh, Youth Hub was there also. Our next meeting on June 12th, Councillor Frenier has stepped up to offer assistance also. Uh, many years on council, Councillor Frenier was the, the leader on council back in the day for the skateboard community, and also she's been chair of Parks and Rec and Boys and Girls Club board executive. And she contacted me and she really wants to help out. And anyone is welcome to attend the meetings. Um, it's going to take a while to build. We'll have another meeting in September. We got to get out to the school boards and that. And our vision is we'll make a delegation to council once a year. Uh, at 5 o'clock on the 12th. Um, my wife Mary and I participated on uh, May 5th in an event organized by the Indigenous Hub, Red Dress Day Walk. Uh, it was the first annual Red Dress Day Walk in honor, of, in honor and commemoration of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit. The community was encouraged to wear red or exhibit red dresses outside of their businesses and homes. The walk was a success. We walked all the way to uh, the PMC and back downtown. And much appreciation goes out to the community for their support by displaying red dresses in their shops. Uh, those who wore red and those who walked with us. Um, I want to echo the comments of fellow councillors about the Community Expo and uh, what a success it was. And you know, thank the city, the BIA, Eco Pembroke volunteers, everyone um, I was there with the, the community garden um, and the community watch booth, but mostly the community garden. You can't be two places once. We were beside each other. And I want to thank the volunteers we have in the community watch. These are the grassroots that have stuck with this. And we just found out soon we're going to have another neighborhood in Johnson Meadows certified um, after the police boards approves it. Um, I want to thank Deborah and Gary Andrews, Steve and Sandra Halpenny, and I want to thank Kevin Cleish. We all know Kevin for helping me at the uh, community garden booth in the rain barrel. And I, I was talking to, um, I had a booth, I had the, the honor of having a booth beside Joe Kowalski. Joe Kowalski, the founder, owner of Wilderness Tours. We had many great discussions. He's still full of energy. And he introduced me to uh, international students. Um, they came to his booth first from China. Jamaica and India and they they're going to Algonquin College they came all the way across the world to attend program in Algonquin and Joe was saying you know how how and I was saying how amazing this is and they've been in Pembroke um, the the woman from China her husband she's going to volunteer at the community garden he has a job at the mall and they asked me if we had public transit and I said well we're moving the file forward that's the most important thing um, so, you know, I wanted to take a shout out to Joe Kowalski because he talked to me about when the college was founded, how we had many discussions with, with uh, Councillor Jackano when he was mayor and how it's developed and what an asset it is to the community and also the fact that um, the outdoor sports program they have, outdoor recreation, is worked in partnership with Wilner Stewart. So just want to commend uh, Joe and Wilner Stewart for that. Um, the trade, the, back in the day when my, my dad and grandfather in the 50s, there was the Pembroke Trade Fair, and they had it in the 60s, 70s. I remember going in 1980, the whole upper mezzanine was packed. So now we have a community expo, and I had a good chat with Elijah McEwen, the staff member, and it's community expo, it's not business expo, it's community and business, so it's all these services together. So the goal is eventually we fill the whole mezzanine. And that, that's the goal, so that's what it's all about. Um, 
what, is, what else do I have here? Rain barrels cutoff date is, is May, uh, May 22nd. We've sold 86 barrels, and uh, you, it's all online at rainbarrel.ca. And uh, you can talk, contact myself or, or the mayor for more information. Um, the final thing I want to say is the Pembroke Farmers Market is opening this Saturday at 9 a.m. And Mayor Gervais and I have been invited to slice the bread. And uh, new vendors this year offering very goods. And the Farmers Market is open every Wednesday and Saturday, 9 till noon. So uh, come on down to the farmer's market, and um, that's a wrap. Thank you. A few people tonight doing well. That's a wrap. Um, I, I appreciate, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I appreciate that you mentioned uh, Mr. M uh, McEwen. Um, Mr. McEwen is presently off on a leave, and this is the commitment from our staff. Despite the fact that he was on a leave, he was there at least two times making sure that the, uh, everything went smoothly. Um, Okay, so if we can, we're now going to be moving into a closed session, and I believe Councillor Frenier has that motion. I do. Okay. Motion for Council to move into a caucus meeting May 16th, 2023. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Troy Purcell, that this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on to be carried on by the City of Pembroke and the Township of Laurentian Valley related to a possible future development, Section 239-2K of the Municipal Act, and personal, personnel matters about identifiable employ, individuals, including municipal or local board employees, to discuss operations staffing and the CAO performance appraisal. Good. by Councillor Lafreniere, second by Councillor Purcell, that this meeting become a closed meeting to discuss a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by the City of Pembroke and the Township of Laurentian Valley related to possible future development, Section 2392K of the Municipal Act, and further uh, personnel matters about identifiable individuals, including municipal or local board employees, to discuss operational staffing, and secondly, CAO performance appraisals. Uh, call the question, those in favor, and that's carried. We will now move into the closed session.